it's been a very material tightening in financial conditions over the last couple of months. It feels like we're in a bond bear market. The recession chatter is picking up. People are looking at the glass as being half empty. There are a lot of half full notions out there as well. The consumer is still outspending um, and has actually been pretty stubbornly resilient. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Ferro. Futures down a little more than a tenth of 1% on the S&P TK. It is all about the squeeze on this consumer. It's a squeeze on the consumer with a shock nine statistic. John, I'll let you talk about it. 9% of the United Kingdom. I went, oh, wow. But it's a squeeze across all. And what I would discern here, John, you just can't parse out energy and the rest. It's about core. CPI, it let's call it collegially a double of what we've seen pre-COVID. One of the most important notes of the last 24 hours on Wall Street came from JP Morgan in the investment bank. Tom, cruel summer, why US gasoline prices could break above $6 <clears throat> later this year. That is a big, big deal. Just got an invite to the in-house JP Morgan London call, John, on oil. This is Christian Malik and their team. And you know they model out and they really walk through the why we're going to $150 a barrel, maybe only $120 a barrel. But the answer is J.P. Morgan and others see oil prices higher because of conventional analysis. Lisa, if it's about the squeeze, just how much does this Fed need to squeeze? And how much are they willing to? I mean, honestly, what Fed Chair Jay Powell seemed to say yesterday was basically a fight for Fed credibility. He came out basically saying, we're not going to take such a nuanced view of inflation. We're going to go at this hard. We need to regain price stability. That is the bedrock of this economy. And if we don't have that, we have not done our job. He was the most hawkish that people have heard him in a very long so time. So let me throw this at you. The market rallied yesterday. Let's put that to one side. If it continues to rally through the next few weeks, is that considered an unwarranted loosening of financial conditions that the Fed has to push back against. And if that's the case for this summer, as the Fed put a lid on markets, put a lid on risk assets. It's a little bit more nuanced than that. I agree with you, right? Because that's been basically the story that any time there's been a sigh of relief in markets, that's a bad thing for the Fed because it's exactly not what they want to see. However, where did it rally? You saw the havens rally, the classic havens that became the like left for dead stocks, the big tech names. How much are people reverting back to a belief that the Fed can get inflation under control, even if it causes a recession? And then the behemoth to actually make money look better because yields are going to get under control over the long term. I know this is counterintuitive, uh, sure, but these you. are some of the things that I was thinking about yesterday. One note, Bramo, front end of the yield curve. What happened? This market gets it. Two-year yields adjusted higher. They adjusted higher when we heard from Chairman Powell. They adjusted higher when we got that upside surprise on retail sales. People are expecting them to go hard. Neil Kashkari of the Minneapolis Fed, the classic dove, said it was easy for him to be an Uber dove uh, it, when the inflation was low. Now it's easy for him to be a hawk and raise rates. He doesn't know if he's going to have to cause recession. A real shift on the Fed, and it is persistent Massive. and really consistent yesterday. What a tough moment for this Federal Reserve. Tough moment for this market, too. Here's your price action in the equity market on the S&P futures, negative two-tenths of 1% on the Nasdaq. 100 down about four tenths of one percent. Yields look a little something like this 295.86 on a 10 year, down three basis points. And the euro, euro dollar 105.26, that currency pair, Lisa, negative two tenths of one percent. Among all of the economic data that we've been getting, I am really trained on all housing data because this is one area that people say has a persistency to inflation going forward. Rent inflation tends to trail uh, the housing sales inflation. 8 30 a.m., we get U.S. April building permits and U.S housing stats. This comes at a time when housing prices are still rising at a near record pace. How much do some of the builders respond to this at a time when labor is expensive, the input costs are expensive, and frankly, there's concern about overbuilding. If they start to decelerate, how much does that indicate a, a, a slowdown that perhaps is what the Fed wants to see, but perhaps will actually cause people to bring back some of their expectations for growth? Today, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen over in Germany, she's holding a news conference at that G7 meeting in Bonn, Germany. Uh, it's going through May 20th. We're going to hear about the European gas potential uh, embargoes on Russia and more importantly oil. But I want to hear what she has to say about the connection between actual crude products and the refined goods because there has been a big dissonance here. Sure, we talk about oil prices, crude prices, Brent uh, and WTI, but gas prices are in a consistent trajectory up, kind of like that JP Morgan note that John was talking about said. And that I think is important to note because this bleeds into the consumer appetite to continue to spend. And today, 
Speaking of spending, retail earnings continue target and lows before market. Uh, TJ Maxx and, uh, is at 9.30 uh, Eastern. And then Bath and Body Works coming out after the bell. This comes after Walmart. I know Kaylee's been talking about all morning, plunging the most since 1999 yesterday after really bringing back their forecast. Sean, how much is this an idiosyncrasy and how much really is this the bellwether? Down 11 percent in yesterday's session. Lisa, thank you. Tom, what was the story yesterday? The resiliency of Home Depot or the troubles of Walmart? I think it's a macro call on recession. There's a lot of people out there, John, modeling in recession. It's out there somewhere. Maybe it's in closer, but there's another group, John, saying there is a resiliency. We will not get two quarters back to back negative GDP. What I would focus on, I mentioned this in the last hour, John, Japan is one indicator of the importance of studying trade, export dynamics and import dynamics, and maybe that will be the deciding point in late summer of where the United States is. Kit Jukes thinks we need to talk more about Europe, so let's get to Kit Jukes now. The chief FX strategist at SockGen. Kit, your words. ECB rates have been negative for almost eight years. If the economy can sustain positive rates within the next year, the euro will be a lot stronger when it happens if kit let's talk about the if how big is that if huge enormous i mean okay so the first piece is obviously the short term um elephants in the room downside risk which is what if the gas gets turned off uh, and natural gas gets really really expensive that's bad for everybody but it's spectacularly bad for europe so um, i don't see how we avoid a recession if that happens even the eu commission admits or pretty much admits uh, that, that, that we'll get a recession if that happens. So that, that's the first piece. Um, the, the second piece, you know, they've been going one way, really, lower and lower rates for, for long enough that, that, you know, the first turn upwards will have a, a significant market reaction. And, and already, you know, we have clients asking, you know, where is the, where is the real sensitive point on the spread between peripheral and, and German bond yields mm -hmm. in Europe? Uh, you know, all of these things. So, I mean, I would put the, the if in, in, in sort of, you know, three foot high capital letters. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's even less likely than Arsenal making the Champions League. Kit, the hallmark of your work is in a few paragraphs, you squeeze in a lot on a lot of different countries, cultures, and economies. Right now, there is a massing, excuse my French folks, pissing match in the United Kingdom over the governor of the Bank of England, Mervyn King, the ex-governor, going after him, Ambrose Evans Pritchard and the Telegraph and others coming to the defense of economists who put their, leg, uh, their pants on one leg at a time. What's the Kit Juke scorecard on how central bankers worldwide are doing? Uh, they're doing their best. Look, I mean, the only analogy I can have for central bankers at the moment is we're saying, can Tom Hanks land his plane on the Hudson? But his plane this time, it didn't have a bird strike. It was hit with a bird strike. Then it was hit with uh, an electrical storm. Then it was hit with lightning. And then President Putin fired a missile at it. Uh, which, which Tom Hanks can do that for all the movies we've ever seen? So I, I give them a break. They had no chance. They did their best by flooding the system with money uh, back at the start of the pandemic. And since then, they're, they're literally... I, it's why, in the end, we'll get a recession because this is too hard. Well, uh, and, and, and critics can, can criticize for all that. Kit, when you say we're going to get a recession, you're talking about Europe. I know that you and your colleagues don't believe that the U.S. necessarily is headed for recession. Do you think that those uh, dualities are basically priced into the euro uh, U.S. dollar already? Or do you think this has more to go and you could get to parity and beyond? I, I think the trouble with the euro, to me, is back to that issue with them. Um, with, with a stoppage to the gas, which brings the recession forwards in terms of time uh, and, and breaks through. And I can't, I, can't measure, I can't measure the downside to the euro from that or the probability of it happening. So how can I buy the euro? It's just, that's why I find it un, unbuyable at this point in time. And I would go on trading. But yes, there is a big difference in the US and Europe. I'm not sure it's completely pressed in. I, I definitely think it's why treasury yields have got more upside. We have not seen the peak yet. Uh, and when that happens, I suspect I'll see lower levels in, in the euro before we're done. I would say, though, you know, we will get a recession. I mean, models struggle with the recession because it's difficult to work out the accumulated effect of being bombarded by so many once every five year shocks in a two year period. Kit, you sound like a hard landing guy. You just said we'll get a recession. That's not really the call, though, is it? It's about magnitude and timing. Where are you on it, that? It, I, I kind of think next year is really the difficult year, but it, but it could come again. There are things that can make it come forward. So, you know, um, when, when you're talking about um, oil prices are up and then saying that the other prices are up more, 
every other version of oil that I use is up more than, than crude. So yeah. up most is jet fuel. Uh, diesel's up a lot. Heating oil's up a lot. You know, so they're all, they're all up by more than crude. So if we get another push higher in crude, it's going to really hurt. If this summer's harvest give us brutal food prices, that's going to really hurt. The housing market in the UK is just threatening to roll over now, and yours could follow. So, um, so I, I would say recessions are pretty likely in 2023 in lots of places. I think it's, it's just plain blind luck if we can avoid them with, with, the, with the number of, of, of pressures coming to the system. Um, but Europe is is right in the firing line. That's really the problem. Okay, awesome to catch up. And just remember, you brought up Arsenal, Tom ignored it, and I didn't mention it. Okay, just no, remember. We're trying to be, you we, know, it's it's. We're still friends. It's, Kit Jukes is such a kid. Thank you, buddy. That you didn't it's ignore it. No, just <laughs> highlighting the fact that he brought it. it up and Tom ignored it, and I'm not going to build I, on I it. Just, okay, yes, we won't yes, build on that. Mean. We'll talk about this squeeze of the consumer stuck between a rock and a hard place and a central banker with no idea how to respond to it. I'm looking to the UK, Tom. What a brutal moment for the United Kingdom. And I go back oh. a couple of weeks ago to a Bank of England decision where we all asked the same question: Is this in the future? of the Federal Reserve, and if it is, we got some problems ahead. With all this conversation this morning and the uproar in the United Kingdom with a very different economy, John, it just drags me to July 27th. I think, I think the, the Fed talk right now is easy. I mean, it's, 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 it's simple. Boy, does it get hard after the next meeting. It gets harder for the UK and yeah. the ECB, for Europe. Right now. The question is, Lisa, when do we actually see a peak year-over-year -year inflation rate in the UK and Europe? Because we might have seen it stateside. I'm not sure many people think we've seen it there. Yeah, and does the ECB take the same tone that Fed Chair Powell did yesterday? We don't really care where the inflation's coming from. we got to get it under control. Futures down two tenths on the S&P. The market is OK. From New York, this is Bloomberg. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. They're the most hawkish remarks yet by Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. He says the Fed will keep raising interest rates until there is, quote, clear and convincing evidence that inflation is in retreat. Powell told a Wall Street Journal live event the economy is strong enough to withstand tightening. Inflation in the UK has risen to its highest level in 40 years. Consumer prices surged 9% in the year through April. A big chunk of the increase came from a rise in energy prices. All that will add to pressure for action from the government and the Bank of England. And Finland and Sweden have made it official. They've now applied for membership in NATO, a move that reshapes Europe's defenses. Still, the two must overcome opposition from Turkey's president, Erdogan. Erdogan alleges both countries support Kurdish militants that Turkey sees as terrorists. And scandal-plagued Republican Congressman Madison Cawthorn lost his bid for a second term despite last-minute backing from former President Trump. North Carolina State Senator Chuck Edwards beat him in the Republican primary. Nearly every Republican leader in the state opposed Cawthorn. And the board of Twitter says it plans to enforce its $44 billion agreement to be bought by Elon Musk. Directors voted unanimously to recommend that shareholders approve Musk's bid of $54.20 a share, almost $16 higher than where the stock closed Tuesday. The board's statement came as Musk appears to be maneuvering to ditch or renegotiate his offer. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Inflation is, is coming down. That's what we really need to see. So we'll be watching for that. If that involves moving past you know, broadly understood levels of neutral, we won't hesitate at all to do that. We won't. Chairman Powell focused on one thing, getting inflation back down from New York City. Futures negative two tenths of 1% on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100. Softer as well, down about a half of 1%. Yields a little bit lower by basis point to 297.14 on a 10-year crude. Very close to 114. 113.98 up by 1.4%. TK, the average gas price in America right now, Pushing 460. 
Yeah, the distillates is with Javier Blas's world-class coverage, John, and Lisa mentioned this earlier. John, we are done quoting Brent and really having a meaningful discussion because the distillates set Brent at a far higher price. And, Tom, the refining issue is a big, big one. I mentioned the J.P. Morgan note a little bit earlier this morning, <clears throat> about 10, 15 minutes ago. They're looking at $6 crude later this summer, maybe, Tom. $6, rather, $6 gasoline. Yeah, well, I, you want to go back there with crude. I know what you're thinking. It's a hazardous game uh, to, to try to game this out. But I will say, John, much of this has less, less to do with the war in Ukraine and much more uh, to do with, uh, let's call it, microeconomics of petroleum. Well, on refiners, Tom, and this is yeah. what they had to say, refiners produce more gasoline ahead of the summer road trip season, building up inventories. But this year, since mid-April, U.S. gasoline inventories have fallen fallen yeah. counter-seasonally. That's been the story. Harsh headline, John, just out. Russia expels 34 French diplomats in retaliation. Anything else, Tom? No, I don't, no? Know, what, I don't know what to make of that. I mean, you know, the, the war continues and, you know, slogs forward is not the right word here, but it continues. Back from Abu Dhabi, Emery Horton joins us now, Bloomberg Washington correspondent. She's been getting up to date on our domestic politics. Emery, I think an important question this morning with this wicked tight Pennsylvania race is the effect of the right and conservatives on the middle. What did we learn about the middle of the Republican Party, the middle of the Democratic Party in the last 24 hours? Well, it's really a mixed bag, depending yes. on which races you look at. And it's across the entire country. We had Idaho, Oregon, Kentucky, North Carolina, Pennsylvania. You see in some places progressives really won big. In other places, Trump candidates won big. And then you have this race in Pennsylvania that's very dramatic and everyone is laser focused on. You can see the divisions of the Republican Party. You have an ex-hedge fund manager from Bridgewater Associates, David McCormick. He has a lot of Trump employees, actually, within his his campaign. But then you have the individual that is backed by Trump, um, Mehmet Oz. We grew up knowing him, or I did, as Dr. Oz. And it's very neck and neck in this race. And the reason why everyone's so focused on Pennsylvania, because this is Senator Pat Toomey's seat. And he's a Republican. And if Democrats were able to win this seat, they have a potential to maintain control of the Senate when many say that the House is really going to swing to the Republicans. And what's important here, Anne Marie, is within our domestic politics, there's only domestic issues. I mean, you're just off the plane from the United Arab Emirates. And I'm sorry, international affairs is not even part of this discussion. It's about inflation and it's about the culture wars of America, isn't it? Well, yes, domestically, those are the important issues. Let's look at the likes of inflation, as you mentioned, and also abortion. These are going to be two big issues, a social issue, an economic issue, heading into the November primaries. But, Tom, I would argue that maybe candidates won't talk about international relations. What was going on internationally is affecting things like inflation. I mean, I had some chats with Emiratis in Abu Dhabi, and I can tell you this, and also other chats last week with uh, OPEC, officials. They're quite concerned about things happening in Congress, like this panel voting for a NOPEC bill, right? So these the story of gasoline prices, which today, uh, you know, we're closer to $5 an average across America than we are to $4. And we are just about two weeks out from peak driving season. We're not even in high driving season. You may start to see candidates talk about some of the international issues going on that play into the domestic uh, domestic stories. And Marie, this is incredibly relevant in Abu Dhabi. I wonder how much this is about Tony Blinken going to the Emiratis and saying, please, please give us more. Please open your tabs, give other people more, make sure that our exports aren't going as strong so that we can actually shore up uh, some sort of price stability. Was that part of the undertone of the meetings? Well, listen, we don't know, right? So uh, Secretary Blinken decided to go to Abu Dhabi because he was joining with the vice president and a, a slew of high profile of U.S. officials, including Bill Burns, Secretary Austin, and uh, climate envoy John Kerry. He then did meet with his Emirati counterpart. This was a closed-door session. They had dinner, and that's all we really know about it. At the same time, we don't know what the ask was, but we do know the United States has been asking OPEC producers to pump more. But the issue right now 
now is less so oil and it's more about refining capacity. I would say it's a bit of both. But you have the Saudi oil minister talking about the fact that it really doesn't matter if we pump more oil. The issue is you cannot turn that crude quick enough into the products consumers use every day, right. diesel, jet fuel, and gasoline. And that's really a major issue right now uh, going into the summer months. And Anne-Marie, as we've been talking about for months, Nuance doesn't sell in Washington, D.C., but what kind of policies, nuanced policies, could be implemented to really bridge this gap with refined goods and crude? Mm. Well, it's difficult. You cannot build a refinery overnight. I mean, we've had refineries shut down before the pandemic. Um, there's not a lot of investment in this industry, and this is not just the industry that feels hostile with this administration. This comes from the whole wave of ESG from the banking sector as well, and also the electorate, right? President Biden ran to be a climate president, and this really turned out a lot of the vote with the youth, especially. So when it comes to refinery, this is going to be incredibly difficult to change overnight. This is months. This is really years. And when you have already an issue and then it's been exacerbated by the war in Ukraine because Russia itself has taken off the market maybe one and a half million barrels of refined products not just of crude, of those actual refined products. Um, and it's very tricky because now we're in the summer months and this is where we really see peak driving demand in the United States and also people going on vacation. Look at ticket prices. They're going to they're gonna go higher yeah. because you have jet fuel, diesel, et cetera, across the board. It just keeps going up. Jet fuel and the airlines, just unreal. AMH, thank you. I'm Bloomberg Washington, correspondent down in D.C. At least we touched on this a little bit yesterday. You've gone from understaffed to overstaffed undersupplied to oversupplied. And if you think about where the lack of capacity is right now, energy, and to some degree, the airlines, and that's all deliberate. Well, yeah, that's actually the key question. How much is this uh, intentionally reduced supplies in order to increase pricing? As that we can see that people continue to pay those prices uh, uh, for airlines. Honestly, this is going to be a point of increased focus, certainly in Washington, D.C. I mean, without a doubt. They've told us it is, though, right? Well, I mean, but how much The airlines have told us that. Right. The airlines have. But how much is the oil and the gas prices really having to do with some sort of intentional okay, price that, that I'm with you. Yeah, I mean, like, no, I, I don't know I'm that I buy you. that. I, I'm I'll not be Elizabeth Warren, I, yeah. just to be clear. <laughs> Okay. A lot of people are confusing not you. Not changed overnight. Say, I, mean, not changed, not I was kind of shocked. Overnight. I was like, who is this? Don't, we, don't worry. No, I'm Arsenal. I'm still here. Futures down <laughs> two tenths on the S&P. From New York City, for our audience worldwide on TV and radio, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning, good morning for our audience worldwide on TV and radio. Here's the price action for you on equities. The S&P 500 down by two tenths of one percent. Futures slightly negative. Here's a headline for you. Target. It's a downside surprise. EPS coming in at 219. The estimate three dollars and six cents. Margins lower than expected and margins for the year. They guide a little lower as well. This is sounding a whole lot like Walmart. Target down by 7.6% in early trading. And this CEO note from Brian Cornell, this quote sounds a whole lot like Walmart too. Throughout the quarter, we faced unexpectedly high costs driven by a number of factors resulting in profitability that came in well below our expectations and well below where we expect to operate over time. TK, that stock getting hit in the pre-market. You look at 40 headlines come out, John, and I go back to the legend Philip Carre, who died at like age 102, and he would talk about the bright lights of inflation. We had a nominal GDP, John, that was a gift to performing well, 12%, 10%, 7%. The comp sales of Target don't look like that kind of nominal GDP. They look like a normal economy, and you have to adjust given the labor costs, given the petroleum costs. It's how things fall from the top line, Lisa, to the bottom line, and the margins are getting squeezed. Yeah, and this is what a lot of people were expecting, just how much they're being squeezed, though, even surprised the CEO. And some people, you were saying this yesterday, John, why are they surprised? We've been reporting on this. You can see what the strain is. Uh, 
uh, right now. However, I still find this interesting, the fact that CEOs are coming out, they're downgrading their forecasts for the full year, which also it, we're seeing from Target. How much is this a precursor to trying to test consumer demand pushback, raising prices for the population that can least afford to absorb them? Well, I don't think they can raise prices anymore, and that's part of the problem, isn't it, TK? That's why margins have ultimately well, come in. That's something that Walmart is grappling with and seemingly Target is too. I don't see evidence of that yet. I think, John, you're right. We may see that as a next step. What I see is a changing economy. We have the gift of huge effervescent real GDP with huge ginormous inflation, and that is shifting. And you see it in the headlines from Walmart and Target. And Tom, I'm confused here. We've missed on revenue, or rather revenue is decent. We've missed on profit. This is a margin story right now. Oh, yeah. It's a margin right story now. right now, but they can fix that. I mean, that's what people do. They, I, I, I'm going to say this, John, and our next guest will be malleable about this as well. They're malleable. They can adjust. But Tom, wasn't that the story and, last year? They did uh, adjust. I think that's they more put now. prices up. No, I think it's more now, John. You're going to see some brutal decisions made. Everybody's quiescent about this. I think you're going to see, and, and Hotsius yesterday at Goldman Sachs alluded to this, you're going to see some tough, you're going to see, John, October planning in May. Yes, we're totally on the same page. Let's be very clear about this. Last year was about putting up prices. Yeah. The stomach what's happened with inflation. This year's the cost side. The consumer side. could tolerate it. Yeah. This year's the cost side. TK, yep. we're on exactly the same page. Yeah. The stock's down 13.6%. Problem is, though, Tom, for some of these companies, they believe that over time things may get back to where it was. They're Maybe they believe they don't have to make that cost decision just yet. I think they're going to amend it, and they're also going to amend it based off a of Fed, a central bank that's not going to be nearly as hawkish as the zeitgeist that's out there right now. Future's negative nine, John, all of a sudden negative 14 off that bout of headlines. As the world starts to look a little more like <clears throat> Walmart, Target, Lisa, right. one data point, here's your second. So the other question, though, is how much does this have to do with the change in what people are buying? They're not buying the higher margin items. They're buying food. How much is this a specific story versus exactly to your point, a broader one that's going to really test the resilience of consumers to higher prices? Still? Product mix. Lisa, that's exactly what Walmart was discussing exactly. yesterday. And it sounds like what you're talking about, too. Tom, target down by more than 13 yeah. percent. And it's actually been pretty resilient through the year so far, year to date. The stock has anyway. It's not this morning. We've got the famed surveillance Rolodexes, folks. And there's one. It's a big turning thing. And it's been there, done that is what we call the Rolex. Andrew Slimman is joining us now, senior portfolio manager at Morgan Stanley in charge of the been there, done that uh, division. <clears throat> Andrew, you and I have seen this. First, you try to raise prices. And then there's a meeting on the 14th floor where you say, we're going to cut costs and we're not waiting for October and year end planning. Is that what we're going to see in this quarter? Well, I think what we're seeing this quarter is the consumers pushing back. They're saying you can't raise prices, and so you you know you're, you're seeing classic margin squeeze. And so, enough. You know, it, it could be a situation where the consumer is saying no more inflation. I'm I'm not going to pay the higher prices. And exactly what Lisa said, they're they're grading down. So this is classic pushback on you know the, the inflationary pressures. Unfortunately, costs are still going up. So. You know, you're seeing the, the you know, the earnings misses are starting to come in. So, Andrew, what does this say about earnings potential this year in America? Well, so far, I mean, look, so far we haven't seen it. We haven't seen the, the fall off. I don't I, I think there will be, you know, earnings cuts. The only question that you have to ask yourself is if stocks are down, many stocks are down 20 to 30 percent, do they reflect uh, you know, some earnings cuts. And, you know, to the extent that if stocks are down today that miss, well, they're not down enough. And so I think that's the key question is how much are they going to miss and are they already reflecting that? And that gives me some optimism. I think it's too early yet, but it does give me some optimism on the market that maybe we won't see the magnitude of earnings cut that will be consistent with the, the amount of declines we've seen in some of these stocks. And certainly you're showing a stock today that that's not, that's not the case. Andrew, there's some perverse reasoning on Wall Street right now that if we start to see consumers push back, it's actually a good thing. It's a bad thing for these companies. It's a bad thing for margins. But it means that perhaps there is a natural slowing in inflation, a breaking point where inflation solves inflation. Are we getting to that point? Yeah. 
I think, well, we're, <laughs> we're just getting to that, that part. But yes, I think that's exactly right. It's my view that uh, inflation will peak at some point this summer. I think it's too early. And, you know, you could see a scenario where the Fed does begin to slowly back off. I think that's the optimistic outlook. And this is a first sign. Today is a great example of consumers pushing back on higher prices. And so there's great example. No better way to solve higher prices than, you know, higher prices, you know, hurting, hurting demand. Andrew, how does this change your thesis or how does this shape what you're going to be buying, where your convictions lie for the remainder of the year? Well, I think what I said before is I think what the, the, there are a lot of companies out there that are not necessarily going to see this margin squeeze, but their stocks are down a lot because they, you know, say uh, financials, you know, they're they're this, some of these regional banks are saying their net interest margins are going up uh, and yet their stocks are down 30 percent. So my thesis really doesn't change, which is I don't think. I think it's too late to run out and buy, you know, Uber defensive stocks. I am not sure we have seen the low for the year. I've been around this business long enough to know bad things usually happen in the summer. But we're certainly in that range. And then from a stock picking standpoint, yep. I think you have to go find companies that you think have a good chance of delivering on their numbers, but their stocks are already down a lot. And that is. You know, that's a great game plan, and it's worked for me in previous, you know, kind of 20 percent declines, and that's the that's game plan I'll, you know, continue to pursue. Let's just pause for a moment. We've got a $100 billion name down about 20 percent in the pre-market. On a story, Andrew, we've been discussing month after month after month for 12 months. For most of last year, corporations managed to adjust to Tom's point that raised prices, margins stayed healthy. In many places, margins improved. I find it really difficult to believe that this margin story begins and ends with two companies, Walmart no. Target. Andrew, That's we've been right. talking about this happening for a long, long time. This feels like the start of it. And we may have seen peak inflation. Fine, whatever. But if we plateau at 4 5% and these guys can't pass on higher costs, we've got an earnings problem on Wall Street, don't we? Yeah, and you've got a PE compression problem. Stocks don't go up when inflation is running north of four percent. It's just you know so historically that's the case. So, so yeah, I think it's it's a tough, tough uh, you know situation, and I don't think the market this year is going to put in a great year. But again, you, let's just make sure we take a step back and say, well, thirty-eight fifty. That's down. You know, that's down a lot from where we started the year. So I just I just want to temper that because again, I see a lot of destruction in stock prices already. Clearly not today, the one you're showing, but I do, you know, yesterday the home improvement stocks, they report they were down a lot. And so, you know, they you know, the, the, the surprises weren't as, you know, negatively perceived. So you really need, it's a real stock picking, you know, situation and what companies are can pass on the cost, clearly not the retailers. Uh, and where, how much are their stocks down? Andrew, awesome to get your view, buddy. Great timing this morning too. Andrew Slimman there of Morgan Stanley Investment Management. This name's still falling, Tom. We're down 22% in early trading. Yeah, it's a big movement back. And we got to remind ourselves, John, this was roughly $115, $120 per share in the beginning of the pandemic. Target with a moonshot up to 253 And it's given that back, as you mentioned, John, uh, 170 even a 168 moments uh, ago. I think we need to put in perspective the glide path of these companies before Valentine's Day of 2020. And afterwards, I think that perspective is really going to be important company to company. Elisa, what a move lower in the pre-market. Honestly, and again, to that point that you were talking about with Andrew Slimman, that basically the fact that we've already priced in some pain and then a downside surprise could yield this kind of move in such a big name shows you the potential risk out there, the potholes as people reassess and frankly, the binary outcomes. Either uh, they can withstand this inflationary pressure or they can't. And these names seem to suggest they're going to struggle a bit. It's tremendously difficult to execute in this environment. Yeah. Everyone's finding it very, very hard. I am surprised that there is some surprise here. I'm struggling with this one. I don't want to beat up on the analyst community, Lisa, but to miss like this, to see the stock down like this in the world that 
we've been talking about for for a year now. Yeah. Well, it's kind of surprising. I wonder how much it's surprising. It is. It is surprising that it's surprising. However, how much is this tied to food and things that really came out in ways that people were not expecting in terms of the pace of inflation? The product mix is clearly shifting at a lot of these companies. We're down 21% on target. Futures are lower two by four tenths of 1% on the S&P. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Rishika Gupta. U.S. futures are slipping today after those hawkish comments from Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. Powell told a Wall Street Journal live event the Fed will keep raising rates until there's clear and convincing evidence that inflation is falling. He also said the economy is strong enough to withstand tightening. The Biden administration is set to bring Russia closer to the brink of default. Bloomberg's learned the Treasury Department will move to fully block Moscow's ability to pay U.S. bondholders next week. The U.S. had issued a temporary waiver that let Russia pay its coupons. The waiver expires May the 25th. And the EU is considering whether to use proceeds seized from Russian oligarchs to help rebuild Ukraine. The EU also will propose issuing joint debt. Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba told his European counterparts that the reconstruction bill could reach $1.1 trillion. And new COVID outbreaks in China raise the risk of more disruptive restrictions. Beijing reported an increase in infections on Tuesday. A cluster also is ballooning in the Sichuan province. All this is happening as Shanghai slowly emerges from that six-week lockdown. The Justice Department has sued billionaire casino mogul Steve Wynn to force him to register as an agent of China. The suit argues that the former CEO of Wynn Resorts used his relationship with President Trump and members of his administration to advance Beijing's interests in 2017. Wynn's lawyers say he has never acted as an agent of the Chinese government. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. If it were up to me, I would start with 75 basis points. I wouldn't start with 50. I would give a very clear signal that I'm serious about this and I would try to contain inflation expectations from, from now. That was Mohamed al a little bit earlier this morning, catching up with Francine Lacqua from New York City this morning. Good morning. Futures negative a half of 1% on the S&P. Margins, we have a problem. That's a story over at Walmart and now Walmart Volume 2 hits Target. Target is down 22% in pre-market trading, 167.64. The earnings a miss. The revenue, it was okay, Lisa, but ultimately that's the problem, isn't it? It does not fall to the bottom line. Because they have to pay a lot of higher costs that were unexpectedly more than they had expected. And frankly, I find it interesting they also are downgrading their forward look. How much, again, are these the tea leaves of a wave of downgrades to margins to come? And how much are Target and Walmart, frankly, uh, the precursors to something larger? Well, it was just Walmart. You wondered whether it was just about execution. TK, now you get a second data point oh, and no, you no, wonder how many yeah. more still to come. We spent so much yeah. time last year saying, when's it going to happen? When's it going to happen? We're seeing it happen right now. Uh, John, this is Reg FD. I lived it. In the old days, this stuff would be managed forward. There would be not leaks, but, you know, adjustments, hints, and all that within the dialogue, within the research community, and the executives. John, it ended on one single day when they instituted a thing called Reg FD, and that's why you have this blanket silence from executives scared stiff that they're going to be sued. Boom, you get announcements like this. This is what happens. Tom, you've been critical of the tech sector for doing something similar over the last couple of years. What do you make of this? How are we surprised by any of this? As I said earlier, I'm surprised we're surprised. If you speak to anybody outside of Wall Street and you say, we had a report this morning that the stocks are struggling with higher prices and everyone's shocked targets down 20 percent they'd look at you with a blank face and say what do you guys do on wall street that's ridiculous it's that's the, all you've talked about the, for a year it's the magnitude of the margin drop i mean it's two divided by eight to keep the math simple which i believe is a 25 percent shortfall on margin from eight down to six uh, percent i i noticed say someone like joe feldman at telsey advisory group who reaffirmed and outperform on Walmart even after the hammering yesterday. These adjust off these announcements, you recalibrate, and a lot of people will keep a buy 
on target. Yeah, I mean, I imagine, Tom, if you lose a quarter of your value, it's it's a better offer today. It's a, it's a it little, yes John Templeton would say, shares are on sale. They yeah, are, just a bit. They are on sale this morning. We're down 22% on target, Tom. Yeah, we are. I mean, that's where we are. Let's uh, do this. We're going to dive forward here to maybe what the pandemic looks like in the rest of 2022. We got an update from Bhakti Hansadi, Associate Professor of Emergency Medicine, Johns Hopkins University. Bhakti, I'm going to cut to the chase. Cases a little bit up, hospitalizations a little bit up, but deaths pretty good. Are we going to see a little bit up on the tragedy of the deaths from this pandemic? I really don't think so. If you look at the ICU data, the percentage of hospitalized patients in the ICU is around 11 percent, which is the lowest number that we've seen throughout this pandemic. I do not anticipate deaths rising um, similar to hospitalizations in cases. Bhakti, we were saying before the segment that basically we have reached an endemic point, and yet the conversation increasingly is, okay, if I've gotten vaccinated and boosted and I've gotten Omicron, how protected am I six months later? How much does this actually lead to longer-term brain damage or longer-term COVID uh, types of <laughs> symptoms? How much is that a concern for you versus just lingering fears for people who have basically been conditioned by two years of just fear? Absolutely. So the truth is that even if you've been vaccinated, boosted times one, boosted times two, and have Delta or Omicron, you can still become COVID positive. But are you likely to then become hospitalized and die? Absolutely not. Regarding long COVID, it's not clear. And this is where the research now really needs to pivot and focus. Um, there's numerous theories of what causes long COVID, and it's multi-mechanism, a combination of microclots, damage to the brain, damage to the vagus nerve, autoimmune um, pathophysiology. And we don't know how to quantify how much long COVID is really out there. And really, like, of those who have long COVID, how does it affect their activities of daily living? Right now, the focus is on symptom control. There is no obvious treatment. Um, but we are getting to the stage where newer research papers are showing what are the risk factors for long COVID? What are the modifiable risk factors for long COVID, such as the presence of type 2 diabetes? Dr. Hansadi, we're speaking about this at a time when we've been seeing the reopening and we've been seeing it play out in markets and at businesses. I wonder if we're reaching a point where we've had the limits of how much of a reopening we've had. People are flying around. They're taking the risks that they feel comfortable with. Is this the new normal? Absolutely. I think every single American right now is assessing or reflecting on where we're at right now, what makes sense for their own families based on the risks of their families. Some families still have immunocompromised adults at home, young unvaccinated children under five. And so we're defining what is our new normal. What does graduation weekend look like to you? Are you going to go to the graduation or are you just going to have a small celebratory dinner in an open air restaurant? But there is options and there's options to reintegrate as a community and a society. Dr. Wonderful to get your perspective on things and good to see you again. Dr. Bhakti Hansati there of Johns Hopkins University. Thank you. Not good to see what's happening with Target stock if you are long it in the pre-market right now down by 21.56%. If you're just tuning in just a little bit earlier this morning, about 25 minutes ago, they came out with earnings and earnings missed. Margins not great and the guidance likewise. The stock at least are a whole lot lower, 169. And this follows Walmart. It becomes the same story. It becomes a narrative suddenly. Margin compression is here. As you pointed out, we were wondering, what is it going to happen? This is it. And it comes faster than the CEOs seem to have expected. How much is this a precursor of more to come? And, and really, we have to keep diving into that. How much is this a product mix and a clientele and, and a tertiary uh, uh, buying base that is more price sensitive? And how much is this something that really speaks to the Fed and speaks to momentum in the U.S. economy? Tom, the C-suite is surprised. The, the C-suite surprised, but again, I'm going to go back to gross economics here and maybe something you hear from Michael McKee. And the idea here that retail is adjusting to nominal GDP coming down, the animal spirit of the country, that huge fiscal boom that we had out of the pandemic. And you end up, John, with 12 percent headline growth or whatever the number was. And we're bringing that down, 7% headline growth. I'm looking at the target comp sales, and it tells me a company that's getting back to normal, and they have to readjust. They have to readjust their expenses back down to that normal, say, 3%. Growth. Tom, you've touched on it perfectly. It's about how they adjust. Last year, they could adjust by putting up prices. <laughs> the consumer price tolerance was there. 
And as you've said repeatedly through this morning, this time they have to adjust in a different way. I, it's through costs. And yeah. that's going to have consequences for growth. <clears throat> We're just beginning to hear this, folks, in the many conversations that we have with economists and also with sell-side uh, analysts. There's even some people, John, alluding to over-hiring or where people are coming back from pandemic. Yeah. Maybe there's too many bodies, and that will get—I I would respectfully suggest, John, that will get— back rapidly to where they want to go. That was Walmart yesterday. How quickly we've gone from understaffed to overstaffed, yeah. undersupplied to oversupplied. Margins are good, <clears throat> prices are up to Prices are up and we can't put them up anymore and margins are suffering. Equities are down a half of 1% on the S&P. Targets down by 22% in early trading. From New York City, this is Bloomberg. It's been a very material tightening in financial conditions over the last couple of months. It feels like we're in a bond bear market. The recession chatter is picking up. People are looking at the glass as being half empty. There are a lot of half full notions out there as well. The consumer is still outspending um, and has actually been pretty stubbornly resilient. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow and Lisa Abramowitz. Hello, margin pressure from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Live on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down a half of 1%. TK Target down a whole lot more. Target, I have a symbol here, really, of retail America and of the consumption challenges forward. And, John, I, I'm going to be honest. You will have PhDs in economics at the Fed all of a sudden analyzing retail dynamics of these two people, Walmart and Target. And Tom, it's a downside surprise on EPS, and ultimately it's margin pressure ahead for some of these retailers. We've got to adjust in this market, too. I'm just surprised, Tom, that we are surprised by some of this, oh. to hear the C-suite say that this yeah. was a shocker is somewhat questionable to me. Maybe it's a magnitude. I'm going to add up the listed employees that we've got here, John, and I'm going to do a quick 2.75 million employees between Walmart and Target. This is a huge, huge mass of labor, and all of a sudden that could adjust that thing that we're hearing from economists and from Fed officials. They're watching the labor dynamics of the country, and maybe this is the precursor for that. Lisa, this is a tough moment for Wall Street. Yeah, and to your point, is there an obligation of CEOs to come out and guide Wall Street lower, guide analysts a little bit earlier if they see that surprising increase in prices, uh, you know, earlier, several weeks before they release earnings? This is going to be a big question for Wall Street. When it comes to Main Street, how much is this pushback from consumers? How much is this Target and Walmart not wanting to raise prices as much? Where does that pushback come into play? Andrew Slimman saying we are seeing signs of consumers pushing back, which is on the margins, probably a silver lining for the Fed. They want to see that. A big moment for Tom as well. Tom, in just about 40 seconds, a two-stage Falcon 9 rocket topped with 53 Starlink spacecraft scheduled to lift off from yeah. NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Just any moment now. Can we talk about Elon Musk, the visionary? Can we get away from the Twitter idiocy? Maybe he'll even tweet out, John. This guy in 2009 said we're going to put a thing in air and we're going to take the main rocket, which is loaded with, with uh, rocket fuel kerosene, and we're going to bring that puppy down and land it on a barge. He's got a sense of humor here. The barges are called, of course, I still love you. Just read the instructions. And the one used today, John, is a shortfall of gravitas. They're going to bring that puppy down and land it on a conventional barge in the Atlantic Ocean. It's stunning, John. I, I still am not used to that idea of the retrieval of the main rocket. This is kerosene with a liquid oxygen feathering off. That's only been loaded, John, in the last 30 minutes here. We need to remind people this is an unmanned flight. A TK, just to be clear, walk us through the difference between, say, the vanity project of space tourism and what's playing out before <clears throat> our eyes. Adongo, you, you know the hot buttons, John. John's been with me with a beverage of my choice. A tang, I should say. Usually when we're doing space uh, launch, I use tang with hearkening back to Gemini. But, John, seriously, this is up to orbit, actually doing things in space, not a tourist ride, with all of those tensions, the speeds to get up to orbital velocity. Tom, coming up to 10 T seconds 15. to launch. Let's take a little listen in. T-minus 10, 9, 
eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Full power. And lift off. Vehicle pitching down range. Nominal first stage chamber pressures. Falcon 9 has successfully lifted off from launch complex 39A, carrying our 53 Starlink satellites into space. Now, moments ago, we did throttle down the engines on the first stage, and this is in preparation for Max Q. Max Q is Max Q is the maximum dynamic pressure that the vehicle sees yeah. on ascent. John, that's a key point there. The maximum dynamic pressure is what we're talking oh, about here, and that is a differential here of these very the heavy payloads. John, the fundamental of issue of this, system. back to the space shuttle, is the weight of what they're putting in space. That was an immense chemical challenge for private and public, for NASA rocketry to do, to get the chemistry right and to put bigger stuff in space. Just going from Mercury through to Apollo was a feat with a Saturn rocket, but you can see, John, and on radio, you know that these rockets today are much smaller, John, than the Saturn V rocketry of a world ago. This two-stage Falcon 9 rocket on top with 53 Starlink spacecraft. A successful launch this morning. We're going to leave the pictures up for you following on Bloomberg TV, oh, on Bloomberg Radio. We'll continue the market coverage as well. Futures negative about 17 points on the S&P 500. We're down by about four tenths of one percent. On the Nasdaq, we're down by six tenths of one percent. This, I think, is an important 24 hours from Walmart to target Lisa margins under pressure. This is really the first salvo and what we've been waiting for in terms of seeing real margin compression that is unlike what people were expecting. And it is coming at the basic uh, aspects of the U.S. consumer economy, right? Walmart and Target, what percentage, frankly, of retail sales does that account for? A significant one. And frankly, they're still selling. It's just that they cannot pass along the costs in the way that they used to be able to. Target down in early trading by 21.7%. Let's get to Anna Han, equity strategist at Wells Fargo Securities. Anna, the margin pressure from Walmart to Target. Your thoughts, please. Well, it's certainly a big indicator. Like you mentioned earlier, they employ a lot of people. And as people have a tighter labor, mar labor market, and yet if people are spending less, the question is, can really companies pass long price? But keep in mind also, John, this is sort of what we're looking for, right? We wanted to see demand cool off a bit to balance things, to bring inflation more under control. So, you know, it's sort of the what we were hoping for, but also a little concerning on how much this raises the possibility of recession. And we're looking at the physics of a rocket launch right now, and they mentioned the maximum dynamic pressure. You did this ballet uh, in your physics of undergraduate. Let's cut to the chase, Anna. Are we at the maximum dynamic pressure of inflation right now? We do think generally inflation measures have peaked, but I think it's going to be, you know, using uh, Chairman Powell's uh, language here, <clears throat> Um, it's going to be harder to get that soft-ish landing. I think it's going to be harder to bring down that figure. Right. People were hoping that when we got this sort of 8% uh, headline number that it could come right back down. But we're seeing that's going to take several more quarters. But, Anna, what's so important here, let's go astronautical again, uh, aeronautical again, if we can. Uh, Anna, the, the acceleration function is a squared function. Guessing time on the x-axis is the hardest thing to do in this racket. What are the determinants you're going to use to guess when inflation rolls over? I think one is a dynamic between really how does that good spending go versus the service spending. I think also to see what is a dynamic between when you have a tight labor market and companies are able to or have to be competitive and raise wages 
so that consumers actually have more to spend. But how will that offset with actually companies being able to pass along price because consumers have more money to spend? And then a third component I think that we're underappreciating here is right now household wealth is very heavily tied to the equity markets. I think we saw a historical amount of nearly a quarter of household wealth is tied to equity. So when equities are down like this, it can weigh on consumer sentiment. If we stay down at these levels, you could see sort of that souring sentiment really start bleeding into consumer spending. These are the indicators we're watching, but we're not quite convinced yet that consumer is really decelerating. And I, can you elaborate what you said, which is that this uh, particular series of reports is a little concerning with how much it raises the risk of recession. How so? Well, when you talk about what is the possibility of recession, for us, it's still a tail probability. It is not our base case. And we still put the possibility of a recession by end of 2023 at around 30%. So that's actually quite low compared to where some people are on the street. But the main driver and something that we've all focused on and relied on to pull us out of the recession post pandemic and continue to drive our economy has been the U.S. consumer. The strength of spending and that willingness to spend not just on goods, but as COVID uh, was relaxed, as lockdowns relaxed, on experiences and get out there and travel and put that money to work and circulate through the economy. So if that driver starts to cool down, then becomes the concern are margins really coming under pressure enough that earnings growth will turn negative, that GDP growth could turn negative? Again, not our base case, Lisa, but the tail risks could be getting bigger here. So there have been a number of strategists that have come on and said they still like consumer discretionary because there has been such a wave of spending and because of the strength in the consumer. Would you back away from that kind of idea based on what we're seeing right now in these numbers? I wouldn't particularly back away, but perhaps it wouldn't be our number one call here. And just to keep in mind, you know, some part of that, we've been actually pretty negative on the retailing space to begin with, but we're still uh, positive on the sources where you can have leisure spending, where you can have those reopening trades, the travel tied industries. Uh, on the other hand, what we've been looking at very carefully, especially with the more tightening of the uh, monetary policy here, has been the growth style. You've seen it beaten down so fast this year and you've seen the we think we're starting to see the bottom for the growth style so we're starting to warm up to it again and when we look at the market adjustment here it is off central banks it is off the fed i'm focused on the non-linearity of their fed decisions they have to make it's frankly true for ecb as well link equity market performance into the massive challenges the fed has after the july 27 meeting you know, you bring up a great point, Tom, is how are equities going to handle it if the Fed continues to tighten and we start to really see that GDP growth slow? For us, we do expect GDP to come down, but we also still think that unemployment rates could come even lower. And in that kind of environment, again, where jobs and wage growth is uh, aggressive and wages are going higher, we still think a possibility that equities can go higher from here. Our price target remains 47.15, and there's a reason for that. We think that there could be a change in the leadership here. Again, if growth has bottomed and we start getting a better handle of inflation, that's going to bode much better for these uh, growth sectors. And they are still a large part of the S&P 500. Anna Han, thank you. Anna Han of Wells Fargo Securities. It will be harder to get a soft landing. Someone asking, Tom, is she talking about the Falcon 9 rocket or the economy? Well, yeah, it is. And again, the drone ship landing here will be just extraordinary. To see, I mean, that was to tee you up, Tom, for that moment. I, I know you did. Anyway, I mean, okay. and, and I'm going to tear up on radio. It is just absolutely extraordinary. Uh, you know, we're we're making jokes. Everybody is about Elon Musk and the challenges he have. What's Twitter doing this morning, uh, John? It was a 38 handle last time I looked, but I don't even know right now. This is not the Elon Musk of Twitter acquisition. This is a visionary who said you could take a huge hunk of rocket and put it on a barge in the Atlantic Ocean. And to witness that, I, I mean, it is truly a singular feature, John, of modern space technology. Always, always impressive, Tom. Let's get back to this market because we're seeing a monster move in Target. They got the drone ship at Target. The Target is down by 21.6% in early trading. Lisa, it is Walmart Volume 2 on steroids.
And so what does this mean going forward, right? Because this isn't necessarily a big part of the index like the big tech giants. However, we are seeing this basically speak to consumer appetite to absorb prices and which prices, right? We talk about high gas prices that are heading higher, which is points that JP Morgan note that you were speaking about, John. We talk about food prices climbing here in the US and beyond. How much is this starting to accelerate, pile onto each other to really affect uh, the consumer appetite that we're seeing in these earnings that we're going to see beyond? Average gas prices in this country right now pushing 460 depending on where you live might be a little bit higher might be a little bit less jp morgan in that note calling it tom a cruel summer the u.s gasoline prices could oh. break above six dollars can you imagine later yeah. this summer an average of six dollars no, how that no, changes the I... politics how that changes all of the things that we talk about i've got that famous chart john of of a barrel of oil adjusted for inflation and income growth and i don't know where that's going to be this summer but john you bring up a really important point just as we talked to anna Hahn about which is this is non-linear you go from three dollars and then it's three dollars sixty cents and 420 and every dime up is a hugely non-linear feeling and john i'll be honest i can't handle i can't do it because i don't drive people everybody has a visceral story of what it's going to mean at 480 or at 520 etc something tells me that governments around the world won't get out in front of the public and cite this note from jp morgan and say the following typically refiners produce more gasoline ahead of the summer road trip season building up inventories but this year since mid-april u.s gasoline inventories have fallen counter seasonally. Yeah. That's not going to work politically, is it? Sounds like a good thump speech. Price Get out gouging. There. Yeah, well, price gouging or, you know, the Race nuance. taxes. Refineries. Uh, nuance does not work in politics, <laughs> does it? We'll talk about the politics next. We'll head down to D.C. Futures negative 7 cents to 1% from a beautiful New York. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. Shares of Target plunging in pre-market trade. The discount retailer cut its profit outlook and missed first quarter earnings estimates. Target says a surge in costs shows little sign of easing anytime soon. The company's fuel and freight charges were a billion dollars more than expected. And they're the most hawkish remarks yet by Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. He says the Fed will keep raising interest rates until there is, quote, clear and convincing evidence that inflation is in retreat. Powell told a Wall Street Journal live event the economy is strong enough to withstand tightening. And inflation over in the UK has risen to its highest level in 40 years. Consumer prices surged 9% in the year through April. A big chunk of the increase came from a rise in energy prices, all that will add to pressure for action from the government and the Bank of England. And Finland and Sweden have made it official. They've now applied for membership in NATO, a move that reshapes Europe's defences. Still, the two must overcome opposition from Turkey's President Erdogan. Erdogan alleges both countries support Kurdish militants that Turkey sees as terrorists. And the board of Twitter says it plans to enforce its $44 billion agreement to be bought by Elon Musk. Directors voted unanimously to recommend that shareholders approve Musk's bid of $54.20 a share. That's almost $16 higher than where the stock closed on Tuesday. The board's statement came as Musk appears to be maneuvering to ditch or renegotiate his offer. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Mishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. What a lot of economists are scratching their heads and wondering about is, if we really have to bring demand down to get inflation in check, is that going to put the economy into recession? And we don't know. At least I'll say, speak for myself. I don't know. Neil Kashkari, the Minneapolis Fed president, a big dose of honesty about the future. They do not know. Futures down seven tenths of one percent on the S&P 500. The Nasdaq down by one full percentage point now. It's all about one stock this morning. Yesterday it was Walmart. Today it's Target. Target is down. It is down hard. It's negative 21.5 percent. TK, we've said it repeatedly over the last hour. Margins, we have a problem.
Yeah, absolutely. I really want to focus here on the research. Uh, Drew Mattis at MetLife coming in with a nice quick note. Uh, uh, John Farrell, Mr. Mattis says the distinction here is these are largest employers. As I mentioned, 2.75 million employees. And this is a guy who's congenitally optimistic. And Drew Mattis makes real clear large employers with these kind of pressures is a unique, unique moment. John. Well, Tom, let's talk about unemployment right now. We're in and around three and a half percent in America. We're fully employed. 350 yeah. is the estimate from the Fed and 350 is the estimate for next year from the Fed as well. Can they maintain that? Do you remember when those forecasts came out? Yeah. And Diane Swank came on the show and she <clears> said, this is fantasy land. And Scott Mine had said the same thing. Yeah. How are they going to do this? Tighten financial conditions, get inflation down, rebalance the labor market, and keep not, unemployment at 350 yeah, yeah. and 350. And, and folks, this is really important in that we have a test tube known as the United Kingdom where they've been working on this since the 1920s. And the answer is the fantasy in the textbooks is just that, a fantasy. And we're going to have to confront it here, John. And again, uh, my core theme here, corporations will adapt to preserve their financial conditions and to preserve their free cash flow. That's what happens. And Tom, you've said that so many times and said it so well over the last couple of years. Okay. It's, it's the change, Not as well as Lisa. It's the change in how they're going to adapt, Tom, that I think you're onto speed, something now. Speed, 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 rate of change. And cost, Tom, cost. That, you pull a different lever. You know, at the end of summer, your summer home, you got your Bloomberg terminal going and you're like, okay, we got to do October planning into next year. John, all of that as of yesterday has been yanked forward. The C-suite surprised, Tom, and I think we're all surprised yeah. they're surprised by the inflationary backdrop. I'm going to digress right now. I am rehorting with us our Bloomberg Washington correspondent, and one of the first people in Washington to take an interest in me at Bloomberg was one David Gergen. You know him from CNN, but far more is Mr. Gergen's public service to Republicans and Democrats at Anne-Marie Horton's White House. Anne-Marie joins us now. Gergen out, uh, uh, Anne-Marie, with an important book on leadership. And Kathleen Parker writes it up in the Washington Post this morning. And now, you are the youngest person in Washington, Anne-Marie. The net problem <laughs> is the next youngest person is 78 years old. How did we get to a Washington that you cover, Anne-Marie, where 80 is a normal age for leadership? Well, Tom, I can assure you, I'm certainly not the youngest person in Washington, but you're right. I am on the younger scale, especially when you look at our elected leaders. And this Washington Post article you're talking about is the fact that all of our elected leaders, when you look at really the leadership, uh, Senator McConnell, Speaker Pelosi, the President of the United States, potentially the former President Donald Trump who wants to take on the current President of the United States in 2024, are all in their 70s and 80s. And this is the world we live in where the leadership um, is at the upper end. I'm not trying to be an ageist, but they are aging. Um, and you have a much younger as well voting constituency. So there really is this division of who's leading Washington potentially those who are uh, really the constituents of the country. And Marie, are we getting any sense of how that leadership is changing based on the primary results that we've gotten so far out of places like North Carolina and the ones that we've heard from Pennsylvania? Well, when you look at North Carolina, the really big dramatic headline is Madison Corthron, the representative, and he's been ousted. He had a last minute uh, influence of support from the former president, Donald Trump. But it does seem like the old Republican guard really had enough with some of these headlines coming out of him. This had to do with uh, claiming about Republicans and orgies on the Capitol, cocaine, et cetera. Uh, we would call that potentially the Democratic Party. This White House would call him maybe part of the ultra MAGA. When it comes to the likes of Pennsylvania, this is a very interesting race. It's an important Senate race. And what we just don't know yet, you have Mehmet Oz, who's backed by uh, the former president, uh, Donald Trump, and he is neck and neck with a former hedge fund manager. And you have really two different ideologies of the Republican Party on display here. And this race is <coughs> neck and neck at the moment. Meanwhile, before we let you go, we are going to be talking about margin pressures and we're going to be talking about how much consumers are starting to push back on how much consumer prices are just going up. How does that play heading into the midterms? What is that going to do in terms of the mix of who wins based on polls and based on history? Well, based on history, it means that the Democrats are really going to suffer in the midterm elections. You have another record today for gasoline prices. We're now over 
uh, four dollars and fifty cents. Javier Blas I was just talking to was pointing out to me that in Menlo, Menlo County in California, it's more than seven dollars on average for gasoline. And again, we are not even in the peak summer driving months. At the same time, you also have diesel going higher. I don't know how many times we say this on this program, but we are a truck a farm to truck to kitchen economy. So when diesel goes up, that means grocery bills are going up. And all that as well is exacerbated by the fact that Russia and Ukraine are really big exporters of wheat, of corn oil, of barley. And this is also going to play into the inflation and food security, less so in America, but really in developed countries. But all of this is a global market. So you're seeing inflation. A lot of these pressures are going to hit Americans at their kitchen table and also going to hit them at the pump. And this is not going to go bode well for the party in charge, and that's the Democrats. AMH, what happened to the gas tax holiday conversation? Where's that gone? Yeah, it's still something they're discussing, they're discussing, Jonathan. There's no legislation there as of yet. There's also talk of potentially this NOPEC bill that uh, a Senate panel had said yes, they'd like to go forward to, but that never really works when it reaches the White House, right? Because then that would be antagonizing some of the individuals that have spare capacity to let oil into the market. The issue with the uh, gas tax is potentially they'll make gasoline cheaper, which maybe would then have um, an indirect effect of not helping them because that would mean maybe more people would go out, fill up their tank, and then demand would continue to surge. What you really need in this kind of market is demand destruction. AMH, Amory, down in DC, and Tom, that's the bottom line. Demand destruction. That's well, what many people are focused on. Yeah, but Demand how, destruction. how many people can substitute out a gallon of gas? Precisely. I mean, you With know, what? I, I, I still have to go to work. I remember, John, Maybe. in the second OPEC crisis, up we go, down we went, up we went again, then there was 1986. Should I drive to the other side of the city? Did I really want to spend the money to go, you know, a fair amount of distance. Are we back to that? And I, I, it'll be interesting. Well, it's not to see. about, you know, the cities. It's about what you call here the flyover states, Tom. It's a very different way of living. And these policies are always set by people in cities. And I know they call them the coastal elite, but ultimately, Tom, they're pulling the policy levers and. Well, you know, you, you drive, you drive up to uh, driven by you drive up to Fort Collins Doesn't and see if you can get a case of Coors 3 2. Ramo's got a treat for you in a moment. I'm looking forward to it. Futures are negative on the S&P. We're down about eight tenths of one percent from New York City this morning. Good morning. On the Nasdaq 100, down by more than one full percentage point, and we took a little bit of a dive about an hour ago, following earnings from Target. And it's about the margins, a downside surprise, and the fact that they are surprised. I'm surprised. They're surprised. We're all surprised. I'll carry on a little bit later. Futures are negative. There's a problem here. There's a squeeze on the consumer. They can't pass on the higher costs, so they've got to absorb it through margin pressure. Tom, we've talked about that for so long over the last year, and now you're seeing real evidence of it from two of the biggest retailers in this country, Walmart yesterday and then Target today. It's a shift out. There's no question about it, John. I would be more optimistic and say these companies will adapt. And as Drew Madison, Matt Life, wrote into me, they're going to do it because they're ginormous. Think what the little guys feel after seeing these challenges with the ginormous guys. Well, let's dress up that optimism, Tom. Make it a little bit more clear. Are you optimistic from the investment side or are you optimistic from the economic side? I, I, I can because go both ways. from the economy ways. side, if they're cutting costs to support <clears throat> profits, I would say that's problematic for this economy. I would respectfully suggest the Fed's going to walk it back. On what, Tom? Not sure. It's a tough task. Bill Dudley would say I'm wrong. How soon? Don't know. Soon as you... John... Well, if you're going to make a statement like that... If you're on the street, like that, you never make a time function TK, call. I can say we're going to have a recession. But if I don't give you the scale, the magnitude, or the time, you it's want a pretty magnitude? worthless call. The Houston Astros hit five home runs off the Red Sox in the second inning last night. I'm pleased That's this is magnitude. going somewhere. Okay, let's right. get to the bond market. Please. Two tens and thirties look like this. Your ten-year yield is higher by about a basis point to two ninety-nine fifty-two. <laughs> and just to finish on foreign exchange, euro, Please. dollar, and sterling. Cable negative by seven tenths of one percent, one twenty-four. Inflation in the UK at nine percent. The Bank of wow. England stuck between a rock and a hard place. And as for the euro, we've had official after official talking up interest rates getting back to zero over at the ECB. Ollie Ray was the latest, and I have to say, he's one of the more neutral members of the ECB. 
not one of the most hawkish members of the ECB, talking about maybe quickly getting back to zero. That's the story in foreign exchange, euro dollar, 105.12. Let's get you some single names. Let's get to Bramo for more. Good morning, Lisa. Good morning, John. And I will get to the Astros review at some point. I'm not going to give you a time frame for when I give you a full baseball review. We're going to get to retail in a second. That's where the action is. But before we do that, the, the Elon Musk show, Twitter, uh, we are seeing that $38 price stick, even though they, he proposed a 54.20 target. The board coming out and saying they're going to hold him to it. He's saying, eh, I don't know if I want to pay that. Tesla, you're seeing a uh, sink in, as a result of some of the uh, supply of manufacturing issues in China and so that shows shares are down about 1.7 percent and Netflix such an interesting story when you start to get supply and demand shift around so dramatically what you get is oversupply of staff and you saw Netflix come out and say they are actually laying off 150 people as a result of some of the uh, pressures and the lack of subscribers those shares down about a percent here really though the action all in retail target the big story of the day after reporting uh, worse than expected earnings as as a result of those margin pressures, down 22% and leading a whole host of other retailers lower who are going to report today. TJX expected to report before uh, the open, and that those shares are down in sympathy, about 6%. And Bath and Body Works down uh, also a little bit more than 3%. I do wonder, Tom, the consumer discretionaries, are they just going to remain permanently on sale? Because those are going to be the ones that are going to have a harder they time are. passing along those costs to everyone, especially as they're surprised by the incredible John, cost pressures that just she, emerged. She can do it all. She can do bonds. She can do equities. It's and just, Astros at some point, but I'm not going to tell you it, when. It's just, just amazing. She's great at that, Tom. She's just killer. Lisa With a little Brand bit was... of a bearish tilt to it. I I told her right, let's move on before this goes south. <laughs> okay. Lisa Bramwitz, thank you so much. We'll look for more gloom and equities here coming on. This is the conversation of the week, to say the least, or maybe the month, on the losses in the bond market. Brooke Masters over at the FT has just done a tour de force on PIMCO, the new PIMCO on from Gross and El Arian. And the answer, a big part of that, is Jerome Schneider, their head of short-term portfolio management. And it's real simple. With yield up and price cratering like a bear market we've never seen, Jerome Schneider says the bond math does not work and joins us today. Let's cut right to the math, whether it's off Bill Gross's Monroe Trader or off your four Bloomberg screens. Why does the bond math not work? Well, when you simply look at where we are today, the market needs to take a look at the giant recalibration, which we've seen predominantly in the front end of the markets. We've, granted, we've seen a tremendous part of that come from the marketplace so with, simply with regards to the tightening financial conditions, which markets have really adapted to. More importantly, though, I think what we have to do is rationalize where front end rates have come. Sure. The tightening policy process has come from the expectation of higher rates, but that's also put us on pretty firm, firm, uh, firm footing where we can actually derive a lot of income from where bonds are. And I think that's the bond math that most people are actually simply overlooking in this current environment. Sure, the first quarter is relatively painful for all markets, Tom, but really what we're thinking about is a construct of the market now where you have a two-year note, which is 2.7% this morning. When you decom decompress that, it really implies that the one-year rate in one year is right. about 3.3%, 3 3.4%. And not to get too bond geeky at this <clears> point in time, you're doing that's, a good well, job. that's well above, yeah. that's well above yeah. the, the terminal rate expectations of the Fed at this point in time. So when you think about the marketplace and where we are, investors sort okay, of need well, to rationalize to that the, level. I, I'm going to cut to the chase. With Iverson and with all he's done for PIMCO, turn it around, assets larger than when Gross was, was there, et cetera. The heart of your call was a reticence on owning bonds throughout the bond bull market. You said someday this is going to end. It's ended. Right. When do you go long bonds? When can you extend duration? Well, you have to think about the, the purpose of bonds as a, as a duet, effectively. You have capital appreciation or depreciation, but capital appreciation plus carry and income. And that carry and income component has been understated for the past 10 years. And now probably. it's back. It's back. And so one of that part of the duet is having the second part of the symphony actually come into play and help accompany the theme that is going to be played at this point in time. And that's fundamentally what we need to be thinking about portfolio construction. You know, there's a fundamental change here, Tom, which is simply that not only are we dealing with financial conditions, which are clearly in flux, but liquidity conditions, which are in flux. And that simply means that for an investor, there's a few things that they need to keep in mind. One, transaction costs are higher in their portfolios. Two, when you think about risk allocations, those risk allocations 
allocations need to be a little bit longer in terms of tenor and also stickier, meaning that the cost of those funds actually is more, more, more punitive. And so we need to be thinking about ways to mitigate the volatility in the portfolios and the cost of these transactions, these transactional costs, which means ultimately you need more cash. You need more fixed income in the portfolio. So while it sounds like we're sort of talking our book, when you've seen where we've come from since 2021 with flat yield curves, flat credit curves, we actually find ourselves in a pretty defining moment now where the recalibration of front-end rates and rates in general sort of puts that duet back in back into uh, you know something a little more harmonic right now for it's, people's ears. Jerome, this duet sounds lovely, and I'm sure that it actually uh, is a very great uh, narrative to paint for clients. I wonder how much soothing they require after seeing their earning statements, uh, the results after a quarter that was absolutely horrible, right? A bloodbath for many people in terms of just total losses. How much do we get withdrawals from yeah. some of these short-term bond funds that exacerbate this? How much do we get uh, banks? reassessing their teams of people and cutting jobs as a re result. I mean, this can't go in a vacuum when you see this magnitude of losses in something supposedly safe. Yeah, it's a great question, Lisa. And I think fundamentally, when we think about the market and where we've come from, and where we are today, you, you can't be dismissive of performance in the first quarter, but that's the beta largely. That's the recalibration of rates. And again, the level set is very important here. We came from a very low rate environment with tight credit spreads, and more importantly, very, you know, relatively flat yield curves. People were reaching for income. People were reaching for return across all markets throughout 2021. So when the recalibration happened in early 2022, it shouldn't come as a surprise that there is some mark to market losses. But this again is where the math comes in. And I think investors really should rationalize Rationalize that starting point. So when you think about, as an example, the the beta, if you will, of where fixed income has gone, sure, bond rates, bond prices have moved lower, rate yields have higher. But if you look at sort of the front end, uh, the front end as an example here, the one-year index was down about 100 basis points, one percent. Bonds moved from par to $99 over the course of the first quarter. But what we've also done is recalibrate that income and carry component from something of around 50 basis points to something to something closer to three percent. And so when you put those two pieces together, that puts us in a context of a total return, which is actually still positive. So while we've had a little bit of short-term pain, especially across some markets, the fixed income market actually still can be rewarded for that second component of total return. So that's the part that I think people are going to have to rationalize. Now, in terms of the broader market, Lisa, agreed. You know, that's something that people are going to have to think about in terms of not only the changing financial conditions that are uh, out there, but also the change of opportunity. And so the question is, is it really time to be a hero per se? Well, I think you have to think about ways to sort of, you know, keep pedaling effectively. And to do that until we get clarity on liquidity conditions, clarity on where the Fed is going, and the overwhelming urge, as Jerome Powell stated yesterday, to continue to fight inflation can create a reasonable amount of volatility for investors in their portfolios for the periods to come. And I think that ultimately is the construct of, of thinking about portfolio management these days, is to try to limit volatility and to try to seek out ways to produce returns without adding to volatility in portfolio construction. And that's whether you're an institutional uh, investor or a retail investor, those premises really are the same from what we've discussed over the past few weeks with our clients. Jerome, how busy have you been? Very, very That's busy. That's what I was thinking. And, and, when and was the last been, time you were this busy? It's, uh, you know, 2015 and 16, and this that was the exact type of market where we had rising interest rates. <clears throat> People were a little bit fearful for where the Fed was going. The transparency wasn't exactly clear. What the impact of rate hikes were going to have happen on the market wasn't exactly clear. But yet investors were working for looking for a salve. They were looking for a way to, imp, to really immunize their portfolios okay, and, great. more importantly, let, allow them to sleep at night is really... Uh, how do you claw your your way back from a 12% price decline, full faith and credit, quickly here. How do you do that? You, you effectively look at ways to minimize you, where you want the interest rate curve, look at ways to minimize the interest rate risk and credit risk within portfolios, and not necessarily reach. Stay high in quality. And those are the ways that you can sort of continue okay. to add carry to your portfolios. Jerome, great to catch up, as always. Good to see you in person too. Jerome Schneider there of PIMCO. Futures down eight tenths of 1% on the S&P and the NASDAQ 100, negative by more than one full percentage point and target heading south and then further south, down 22.6% in early trading. This is Bloomberg.
keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Ritika Gupta. Shares of Target fell more than 20% in early trading. The discount retailer cut its profit outlook, saying a surge in costs during the first quarter shows little sign of going away anytime soon. Target's fuel and freight bill was a billion dollars more than expected. Additional hits came from higher pay for warehouse workers and markdowns driven by overstocked inventory. The EU is considering whether to use proceeds seized from Russian oligarchs to help rebuild Ukraine. The EU also will propose issuing joint debt. Ukraine's foreign minister, Dmitry Kuleba, told his European counterparts that the reconstruction bill could reach $1.1 trillion. Andrea Orcella is a titan in European banking. He transformed the investment bank at UBS and then battled Santander over its botched attempt to hire him as CEO. Now he's leading Italy's Unicredit at a time of war and inflation. In his first TV interview since taking the helm, which I spoke exclusively to Francine Lacroix, Bloomberg's front row. Inflation is biting. Uh, we see for low-income low or lower-income families really difficult to deal with the rising cost of, in, of energy. We also see um, that for companies that had investments or that were dependent on energy or on grain to a certain extent, the whole value change has been completely uh, destroyed. And the shares of Unicredit are up some 17% since Orchel's arrival last April. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. I have been concerned that uh, we need to take uh, aggressive action to keep inflation under control. But right now, I think we have a good plan uh, in place. Uh, we've made a lot of moves. To be fair to Jim Bullard of the St. Louis Fed, they haven't made that many moves. We've had a couple of interest rate hikes in QT. I think Lisa starts in a couple of weeks. Yeah, honestly, this the idea when you take a look at the balance sheet, it just basically has plateaued at nearly $9 trillion. And we're talking yeah. about removing liquidity. The moves still to come. The market's made a few big moves, yes. if that's what the president's talking about. Futures negative eight cents of 1% on the S&P, on the NASDAQ. We're down by more than one full percentage point. Stock to watch, there's only one, right? Target down by 22.6% oh. <clears throat> in early trading. Just a monster move lower, Tom. Revenue is not the big issue here. It's about that revenue falling to the bottom line and what the margins look like. And the margins aren't great and the bottom line performance are downside surprise. I like you. You got them as a lead story. I'll go there, John. But my recollection is we were at nine, negative nine SPX futures is those headlines came out an hour and 15 minutes ago and now we're negative 33. So this announcement Move the market. No yeah, without a to doubt, me. Tom. What surprised me, Tom, is you saw the Walmart numbers yesterday, the challenge with margins, <clears> the product mix and all of that, and then Target closed down yesterday by 1.8%. I'm just struggling with what's going on here and how the market's discounting some of this stuff. Did we just think the Walmart story was a Walmart execution issue and somehow there wasn't something broader going on here? I, I just think that it's the new silence that you get from corporations. Let us dive into that, John. This is a big, big deal. Joseph Feldman is with us. He holds court with Dana Telsey at the Telsey Advisory Group. We can talk about Walmart and Target. But Joe Feldman, I want to talk about what you and I lived April 2nd, 2013, the real codification of Reg FD. Are these corporations afraid to give guidance to animals like you? Well, I, I think the corporations are certainly afraid to give inter-quarter commentary that would, you know, give too much of an insight into how the earnings might show up. And when doing so, they do have to make things broadly public and available at the same time. So that that definitely plays into this. Um, and, and I do think that you, you, you've seen uh, corporations act differently. I've seen investor relations professionals get fired over it. So I think people are very careful to not give too much inter-quarter inter inter information. Joe, I struggle when I see a stock down 22% off the back of earnings on something that should not be a surprise. Costs. They seem to be struggling with something, Joe, that was obvious to everyone. I don't get that. If we've got a big execution problem at a single name or more broadly, and when you see two data points, it feels like a broader story. It feels like, Joe, from 
My perspective and others too looking in, they're struggling to find the right balance. These companies have gone from being understaffed to overstaffed, undersupplied to oversupplied. And Joe, all of a sudden there's all this inventory and they don't know what to do with it. Joe, how do you find the right balance in an economy moving this fast? Yeah, I, I, and I think that's really the challenge and, and something actually Doug McMillan talked about yesterday was the speed of all of this, that it's really hard to adjust the, the business that quickly to play some catch up. Uh, obviously, the consumer is moving and changing quite rapidly. And I, I think you're right. I think that, you know, the the retailers, we saw this with Amazon, too, where they kind of were building out <clears throat> to the capacity that they needed at the time during the height of the pandemic. And now you're seeing uh, some of the give back. What's really interesting here is if you go back in history, tar uh, Target's gross margin has pretty been very stable at right around 28 percent. Obviously, this quarter, it really dropped a lot to 25.5%. And their guidance for the year would imply that it's going to be certainly well below the 28, uh, maybe more like 25, 26. I think that's transitory. And I know the stock's down a lot right now. And But if you kind of really look closely at that line item and look at the way they're operating the rest of the <clears throat> business, there's a lot of pressures right now on the supply chain, on fuel costs. Yeah, on, on everything that's just hurting the business right now. I had a brain freeze there, Joe Feldman, because I just got the fuel cost to the Gulf Stream to Davos. Wow, Lisa, that has gone up, to say the <laughs> least. Regulation FD, I put 2013 wrong. That was a little bit ago, 1999 on Reg FD. Lisa? I think I see that little violin in the corner that's just very, yes, very small. Thank you. I think yeah. that, look, I, I don't think that that's probably where people's focuses are uh, on the jet stream. However, there is this issue of what comes next? What's the next shoe to drop after we saw Walmart and Target. Joe, what's your sense here of the other players that will also see similar hits that are not yet priced in? Well, I think that, it, you know, those that have more discretionary businesses are, are likely to see some pressure. Um, you know, we've been pleasantly surprised, actually, to see like Home Depot and Lowe's have been performing fairly well, um, you know, in, in the face of this. And everybody thought, well, home was going to be done and it's not. Uh, at least home improvement is not. But it does feel like we've seen a slower trend in apparel and in, um, in other discretionary categories like home furnishings. That is where we see some concerns. So some of the other discounters uh, may be under some pressure today. Uh, you know, I, I think <clears throat> y you have to just start worrying about everybody on the gross margin side and, and see how that profitability could be impacted by that, even with stronger sales like we just yeah. saw from Walmart and Target. Joe, before we let you go, can you just frame this moment? How much of a turning point this is for a lot of the consumer discretionary areas and frankly the consumer staple companies like grocery stores and others, especially in light of the surprise in the C-suite that to a lot of us shouldn't have been such a surprise? Yeah, I, I think that we were all assuming that the supply chain pressures have been fully factored in at this point, and they're just not. And we are definitely seeing a slowdown or a change in consumer behavior where there's more of a focus on, as you said, consumables, basics, getting to work and just drive it, you know, paying those high gas prices right now. And I think that that lends well to the more the CPG companies that are out there and the, 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 the uh, grocers and other value-oriented retail. Uh, where people are going to be looking to save money right now. Joe, thank you, buddy. As always, great perspective. Joe Foundman there of Towsie Advisory Group. The stock is lower by 22.8%. Hardly mention a story out of China either when it comes to supply chains and when it comes to growth out of China. Goldman a little bit early this morning with a downgrade, joining many others who have done yeah. the same thing. They now expect GDP this year to be at 4% versus 4.5% previously. Tom, right on the line of a three-handle. Exactly. Very, very close to a number that was almost unthinkable a few years ago well, for this economy. But it was unthinkable for Gita Gopinath at the IMF a number of weeks ago, John, with a three-ish on that. And, you know, the WTO with global GDP under 3%, everybody goes, nah, never happened. Well, the trend is in that direction, period. Lisa, things have changed so quickly. It's something you picked up on with Amazon and then onto Walmart, that we've gone from understaffed to overstaffed. 
you've gone from undersupplied to oversupplied with all this inventory at some of these names. There's a real theme building here across three big retailers for this economy. Yeah, how much does this actually play into this idea of a softening labor market? And I don't want to say this uh, lightly, we understand it's very strong, but how much around the margins, Netflix cutting 150 jobs, going by attrition, Amazon curtailing staff, what happens at Walmart? The future's down three quarters of 1% on the S&P 500, on the NASDAQ, down by 135, negative 1.1%. From New York, for our audience worldwide, heard on radio, seen on TV, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. There's just a lot of pessimism in the market, more than we've seen in years. Don't fight the Fed is definitely the mantra in the bond market. The Fed is still trying to bring down, slow the economy, slow employment. For the Fed to rebalance or support the rebalancing in the economy, they do need to cool demand. The trajectory of inflation is important. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrell, Lisa Bramlitz, and Tom Keen on radio and television. And we interrupt this hour of Bloomberg surveillance to see Retail America at new lows. John Target just breaking down 24%, a big 51-point move right now. It is Walmart Volume 2 and some. In a big way, Walmart got hammered yesterday. Target showing Walmart what a real hammering is all about. Tom, margin pressure, it's here right now. And We're talking about it for quarters. Here it is. And what we gave you is a value add in the last hour, John. It's about the bottom, the net income, and yes, it's about EBITDA and all the others. Joe Feldman and Telsey, John, goes to where the target executives are, which is up the income statement to gross margin. And the way you fix gross margin is cut costs. I'd love to know where the target executive has been, Tom, over the last three months. In fact, the last year. Have they been under a rock? TK, you're telling me that we can be surprised by higher well, costs. How are you surprised by higher costs? We talk about it every day. Maybe it was the magnitude of the higher costs or a sum of moving parts. But let's remember the stock is absolutely moonshot through the pandemic. It's down now big and just making those lows 164 on target. But, John, uh, in, in the defense of the, them and everybody else in retail, they're working within a pandemic but now it's over. Now what? And that's the problem, Tom. They're struggling to find the right balance. I think yeah. Lisa's done a great job of this over the last couple of weeks, just joining the, the dots between, say, what's happened with Amazon, what's happened with Walmart, what's happening with Target. We've gone from understaffed to overstaffed, undersupplied to oversupplied. And there's clearly a problem that didn't exist 12 months ago. There's inventory, Tom, and Peloton, a lesser story, of course, spoke to that too. Speaking of Peloton, let's speak to Lisa Bramowitz, three in the house. I mean, I look, Lisa, at the mix that we're in right now, the stew of $6 gasoline from, I believe John said, J.P. Morgan, but also the idea of a fully employed America. How long does that honeymoon last? Honestly, when you have 11 jobs per each, uh, you know, you have basically two jobs for each worker, 11.5 million job openings. How much are you looking at really a lot of froth that needs to be worked out? There's a lot of room for some on the margin pullbacks. At the same time, you do wonder at what point you start to see this bleed into a slowdown. Anahan of Wells Fargo coming out earlier this morning and saying, look, if this continues, if you start to get increasing pushback by consumers, this could be a tell for a downturn. And that is something that an increasing number of investors are worried about. I'm fascinated, John, by the data today. It's pretty quiescent across FX, even fixed income, uh, pretty quiet. But off the target news, negative nine SPX has become negative 33. Futures are down 8 tenths of 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, Tom, we're negative by 1.15%. Looking at the Treasury market yield higher by about a basis point at 299.15. You're talking about the quiet and fixed income. Let me tell you in credit, in corporate credit, the world of corporate debt. Did you see Peloton yesterday, Lisa? No, I missed that. Yes. Fascinating. A $750 million loan, something like an 8% yield. And Lisa, the demand for that off the Richter. I, you know, I didn't really know what to make of this other than people are actually getting yield. A at the same time, you do have to wonder what kind of warrants were on there uh, and basically assurances. Maybe they got guarantees for getting some bikes to pay them back if they were not paid back. Otherwise, if you want yield, here it is, John. You can get it. And this is what a lot of people are looking at. You've got companies that are not going to go out of business in the near term. They're going to pay those coupons. <clears throat> Go and get it. You can actually make your bogeys if you're a pension yeah. fund for the first time I'll in a long time. I'll stay away from the idea of guaranteeing whether those coupons get paid.
I have no idea what's going to happen with some of these companies. Literally, look how fast things are moving, Tom. Trying to find the right balance in this economy, from the downturn, from the quick snapback to the headwinds we face, they're all clearly really struggling to find the right balance, to get the right inventory levels, the right staff levels, the right supply at the right time. And they're doing it within strategist calls for much higher hydrocarbon prices. Before we get to Daniel Morris, John, recapitulate that research note modeling $6 a gallon gas. So the number right now on average in this country is $4.60. JP Morgan came out with a note yesterday and talked up $6 gasoline. This was the quote. Cruel summer, U.S. gasoline prices to break above $6. Typically, refiners produce more gasoline ahead of the summer road trip season. They build up inventories. This year, J.P. Morgan says in the investment bank, since mid-April, U.S. gasoline inventories have fallen counter-seasonally. This is something Javier Blas has talked about, Tom, who'll join us in about 40 minutes' time. It's a problem. What does that study do to utility bills in the United Kingdom with 9% inflation? Hey, Tom, did you see the inflation numbers this morning? Yeah. Did you see what underpinned it? Utility bills have gone through the roof. Well, where are they with $6 a gallon American gas? The answer's higher. I think the answer is things could get worse before they get better, Tom. We will see. Futures are negative 31, and we're watching Target this morning um, as well. Right now, thrilled to bring you for a good summation. Daniel Morris, he's chief market strategist, BMP Paribas. Daniel, Lisa and John got a bunch of questions. I'm just going to go to one. Two days after the July 27 Fed meeting, the Fed will get the PCE inflation studies. What are they going to see? Are we going to see an inflation lessening the end of July? Well, we are looking for peak, at least in headline inflation. And that's, I think, going to have a beneficial impact for market sentiment. It's not going to be every month. Not only is inflation beat expectations, higher expectations, but it's going up in absolute terms. So on the margin, yes, it's better if that starts to roll over. Uh, but we know we're still going to be at a high level uh, in absolute terms higher than the Fed is going to be comfortable with. So I think kind of regardless of what numbers you actually see in the PCE, the conclusion from the Fed isn't going to change at all, which is this is just way too high relative to our target. We're sticking to our plan to raise rates. And if anything, the risk is that they raise more than what you see priced in the market right now. The earnings call just starting with Target. The CEO, Brian Cornell, making a few comments saying they're facing multiple cost pressures. That we know. But saying something that really echoes what we heard from Walmart yesterday, a dramatic change in the sales mix in the first quarter. Dan, consumers are struggling right now. They're struggling and Target stock is struggling a whole lot more too by 23.5%. Dan, where would you be comfortable taking risk in this equity market at the moment, given the headwinds we have, and given the fact that in many places we still haven't fully realized, fully discounted the earnings risk that still lie ahead? Well, I think one thing to keep in mind, we see what's happening now with the retailers that in general kind of coming out of the lockdowns into the reopening trade anyway, demand was supposed to shift away from goods and towards services. And then now you add significant price increases for goods really shouldn't be so surprising that consumers aren't particularly thrilled with that. Whereas if you look at demand for services, there's a lot uh, more in the last to see people more willing to pay that. So I think one thing you want to think about on the consumer demand side, are you talking about goods? Are you talking about services? Uh, in general, though, inequities were uh, on the slightly underweight side, so we're not taking a lot of risk in equities right now. It's more a question of where you feel most comfortable. And for us, it's not the U.S. So we're underweight in Europe. Uh, neutral on the on the U.S., but overweight uh, in emerging markets in China and in Japan. So we just think, when you, particularly when you think about the interest rate risk uh, that the U.S. is facing and what that means for growth, what it means for discount rates, there are, on a relative basis, certainly better opportunities for us elsewhere. So uh, I would love to have you back on to talk a little bit about that China call. It's really interesting, but sticking with the retail story just for today, is there some message, a larger message about liquidity, about breadth in the market, given the fact that such a significant stock is down 24% after this earnings report that really comes after a lot of pressures that were largely expected and baked in and discussed extensively by a lot of analysts as well as economists? Well, I think the liquidity risk is probably more on the corporate credit side. I mean, one advantage and disadvantage in time with equities is that when you have troubled markets, 
uh, you can get out, and that often puts pressure on prices, whereas in credit, perhaps, you can't get out so much. So we certainly do hear from our portfolio managers on the credit side. It's at times been extremely challenging, uh, and that certainly makes you a bit nervous when we know there are plenty of other things that could go wrong. You may want to trade, and you're not able to. Daniel, wonderful to catch up with you, as always, buddy. Daniel Morris there of BNP Paribas Asset Management. Just a few more comments here from Target. The CEO going on to say that we're seeing healthy spending by customers, seeing stronger sales trends in recent weeks. But on the quarter, they saw a rapid slowdown across certain items, certain groups, apparel being one of them. A dramatic change, their quote, not mine in the sales mix in the first quarter, Lisa, something we've heard a few times now. Lisa nailed this, John. Well, no, but this is, I think, a big issue for Target in particular because there was also a lot of more discretionary spending in Target than even Walmart, right? So Walmart has a better mix for, and I say better in relative terms, relative to what we're looking at in, uh, with consumer appetites right now. Target's getting that much more slammed because they do tend to be Target and uh, the sort of upper end of these particular you stores. You put in a TK line. <laughs> well, actually, Target. Shanks. You know, he, he stole that from, not me, but, you know. There, I've done nothing original. Everything I... <laughs> you got so that from everything someone else. Out of my yeah, mouth, that's classic. Everything Tajay, out of my mouth. I'm, a, I'm just a foreigner. <laughs> I have no idea. I have no idea what's true, what's Tom's, and what is someone else's. Tom, we're down 24%. Got a $100 billion name, losing a quarter well, of its value in a single morning. The punchline is 2.75 million employees have enjoyed back-to-back -back days of down, let's round it, John, 20%. This is a massive readjustment in what we see from the larger companies. That's all. There's no other way to describe it. 450,000 <clears throat> employees. Lisa, as Thomas said repeatedly, corporations adjust. Last year, they adjusted by passing on higher costs through higher prices. Do we have to start thinking about costs getting cut? And where do those costs get cut? Right. How much slack is there in the labor economy? How quickly do we see this bleed into some of the numbers that we look at to gauge uh, how much the workforce is shrinking? Futures down eight tenths of one percent on the S and P on the Nasdaq, down by a little more than one percent. From a beautiful New York City, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Ritika Gupta. Shares of Target are plunging in the pre-market trading. The discount retailer cut its profit outlook and missed first quarter earnings estimates. Target says a surging cost shows little sign of easing anytime soon. The company's fuel and freight charges were a billion dollars more than expected. And then the most hawkish remarks yet by Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell. He says the Fed will keep raising interest rates until there is, quote, clear and convincing evidence that inflation is in retreat. Powell told a Wall Street Journal live event the economy is strong enough to withstand tightening. And inflation in the UK has risen to its highest level in 40 years. Consumer prices surged 9% in the year through April. A big chunk of the increase came from a rise in energy prices. All that will add to pressure for action from the government and the Bank of England. And Finland and Sweden have made it official. They've now applied for membership in NATO, a move that reshapes Europe's defences. Still, the two must overcome opposition from Turkey's President Erdogan. Erdogan alleges both countries support K Kurdish militants that Turkey sees as terrorists. And it is a milestone for U.S. Soccer Federation. It's become the first national governing body in the sport to promise its men's and women's teams equal pay. That ends years of often acrimonious negotiations. The U.S. Federation also will pull international payments for the World Cup, so both men and women are paid equally for that competition. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. We're now looking for only one and a quarter percent growth this year on a fourth quarter to fourth quarter basis and then one and a half percent next year. And that, I think that's needed to create a little bit more capacity in the labor market in particular alongside an improvement in labor force participation. 
given the bearishness of the moment, that's actually the constructive outlook on Wall Street. That was Jan Hansis, the chief economist and head of global economics and markets research at Goldman Sachs from New York City this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with your equity market lower by seven tenths of one percent on the S&P on the Nasdaq 100, down about one full percentage point. And Target, Target stock is getting absolutely hammered. Brutal for this name right now. It's negative 24 percent. It's not a major weighting on the S&P. It's about 0.298 percent of the S&P. But this speaks to a major worry more broadly, Tom. Are we going to see a whole lot more of these concerns around margins yeah. through the next several months? If I go into aisle four, John, I mean, what I'm looking for is a Speedo Power Flex brief swimsuit. Or maybe I'd go for the nine-inch marina long valley swim trunks, but that's the heart of the matter. Clothing came to a halt. TK, unfortunately, this is live, and I can't rewind things and edit that. Can, <laughs> can we not even think about what that might look like? I and can you love move on really jobs. quickly? Yeah, we all Goyle with us right Do now. It. I'm ready to anymore. run. Yeah. Poonam's gone. <laughs> so Poonam's is gone. Our U.S. retailing analyst did seriously with encyclopedic knowledge of the floor of the big box stores. Poonam, let's start with a basic question. Are you surprised as the market shock we've seen? Uh, you know, we've been seeing it all year, so it's not that big of a surprise. People care about the margin story, and we saw it across the board, whether it was Amazon, whether it was Walmart, whether it was Target. If margins aren't holding up, investors are penalizing the stock. Let's not go to swimsuits, but let's go to clothing in general. How much does Target make on $10 T-shirts? Listen, the profit margins on clothing are definitely higher than they are on any other category. So when clothing sales um, suffer, margin does suffer. We saw that at TJX, you know, that were also reported this morning, Marmax sales were up 3%. Their profit guidance, on the contrary, was better than expected. And hence, even though sales were weaker, the stock is reflected to be higher in the pre-market. Poonam, the CEO of Target coming out and saying that they saw a dramatic change in the sales mix in the first quarter, as John and Tom were talking about earlier. Do you have a sense of what was underpinning that, of how long that mix uh, will change in terms of consumer appetite? Yeah, look, if consumers are trading off for discretionary to more staples, that is going to hurt margin. We don't think that discretionary spending is dead by any means. We're seeing people go out more, people travel more. It's just where are they spending? Where are they buying their apparel? Um, they are definitely buying it, as you know, I said at TJX, because we saw the Marmax numbers. They were pretty good. Um, will discretionary spending fall as inflation gets um, to be a bigger problem in the economy over time? Yes, that's usually typically what happens. There is a trade-off between discretionary to staples. Putnam, is there a historic precedent for how much of a miss this was, not in terms of the actual earnings, but in terms of guidance for management? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's really all about the margin. It, it comes down to the higher costs that they're seeing in distribution centers across wages. And that isn't going away. I mean, I think that's the key here. Like, do you see signs of the cost pressures passing or lessening over time? And we may be entering a new normal where these higher costs are here to stay. So that means you have to raise prices. What does supply chain cost? Paul Jus over at Citigroup just talks about $1 billion out of the blue of new supply chain costs. Define that on a CFA exam. What is a supply chain cost? It's a lot of things. You know, it's the cost to make the product. It's the cost to get the product to the distribution center and then from the distribution center to the store and into people's homes. So the costs are rising on every single front. It's not one piece of the puzzle that, you know, you have to fix. Okay. It's, it's from the start to finish. What's the history of them raising prices? John Farrell has been talking about the initial tranche. Yeah, you raise prices. Is there a wall they run into or do they just say this is what the bicycle costs? You know, it depends on what competition is doing. When you see the price of milk going up across the board, it's okay to raise them, but there will be a trade down. But if you start to see some retailers do it and some not, then there will be a shift in where consumers spend. So it's a hard and very difficult thing to do to raise prices without trying to press on other levers that you have in place. So I think retailers in general will try to flex costs where they can before really taking a meaningful price increase. Poonam, who's the next target? Who's the next Walmart? I mean, you're going to hear from dollar stores. So that'll be interesting to watch. You're also going to 
hear from some of the e-commerce names, and I think across all of them, you will start to see pressure on the cost side. Um, apparel retailers may be a little better insulated, only because they do have pent up demand this year from celebrations being just a big part of where consumers are spending. Good on, thank you. Put on, go over there of Bloomberg Intelligence, that headline from Target, let's go over that. They offered markdowns as demand for big and bulky goods actually fell. Tom, that's not a headline you would have found in many places I, last year. Yeah, I really don't know what that means. I guess that means bicycles and that. But, John, it also could be the nine-inch marina long volley swim trunks. You, you want know, to do that again? I mean, it could be a number of different things. What's big and bulky? I mean, John, we're talking original statements here. I, have I ever heard big, big and way. bulky discussed well, I think more in broadly, financial media? It's original relative to what we experienced last year. Last year, Pandemic boom. they faced down costs. But they also had to confront a boom in demand yeah. and they could pass, pr pass on higher prices. And Lisa, it just seems to me that for certain retailers executing in a certain way, they cannot find the right balance, find the right amount of inventories, the right amount of staffing that they need at any given time, because this economy is moving so quickly. We had a demand shock, a really positive demand shock at the start of last year. And now this year we're facing headwinds and ultimately could be facing the opposite. We always say unprecedented, unheard of unseen before. And really, that is really what this all highlights, because we saw a period where everybody was stuck in their homes and buying as much stuff as they could. And now people are moving to experiences, right? I mean, we take a look at airline costs, how much the prices are going up there, how much are big and bulky goods, basic staples in homes that people already have in mass and frankly don't need more of. I mean, how much is this an issue of people just saying, you know what, we don't have to pay that higher price right now. We could take a plane to, uh, somewhere else. And honestly, this to me, how do you gauge that out? How do you experience uh, this shifting market with some sort of accuracy? You can't be right all the time on the south side on Wall Street. But wow, Mike Wilson and Morgan Stanley, Tom, what a year he's having calling this market and the dynamics, the issues that ultimately would push it to go lower. It's a, yeah, it's the underlying themes of Mr. Wilson's work. And when you're right, you're right. But it's the why you're right. And what they've really gotten right is the pandemic change, the big macros you mentioned, John, demand idea that we lived, clearly we've learned in 48 hours, that's over Wilson Wright. Seth Carpenter of Morgan Stanley, the chief global economist, joins us next to break down some of those macro themes. Futures down 7 tenths of 1% from New York. This is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning, good morning on TV and radio. Here's your equity market, the price action down lower, but off the lows so far. We're down six tenths of 1% on the S&P, on the NASDAQ 100, down one full percentage point with some housing data. Let's get to Mike McKee for more. Morning, Mike. Morning, John. We care about this because everybody's watching to see whether the Fed is having an effect, and it appears they have. Housing starts on a month-over-month -month basis fall by two-tenths of a percent. Now, the forecast was for a 2%, 2.1% decline. So I suppose you can call that better than expected. Uh, Single-family starts at the rate of 1,100,000 uh, for uh, the month of April. That's the annual rate. Uh, and that's below March. Uh, the building permits number comes in 3.2% uh, below the estimate uh, or below uh, zero, drops 3.2%. The estimate was for four-tenths of a percent. Uh, the prior month was four-tenths of a percent. So that is a disappointing performance for building permits and suggests that maybe we are seeing some capitulation from builders. Yesterday, the Home Builders Index came out. Uh, it plunged, and uh, there was a feeling that maybe builders are seeing a real reluctance of people down to sign contracts on new housing. Uh, interesting number to watch is the housing completions number. We don't often talk about that, but it's down 5.1 percent below March. And we came into this year with a shortage of housing. Remember, the demand has been really strong. And now all of a sudden, uh, we may end up with a shortage at the end of the year, but without the demand that would compel additional supply. So it does look like the Fed is having an impact. Uh, higher interest rates now over 5% for mortgages are seeming to slow not only uh, 
mortgage applications, uh, which were down 11% today, 11% last week. I mean, week. Mike, just to jump in, that's the real number, isn't it? Yeah. The applications number. Yes, people are dropping off the, uh, they're not uh, make, entering into contracts or trying to buy homes anymore because it costs too much. Mortgage applications, Tom, down 11% to Mike's point. We're not seeing a massive move in this market. We're down 7 tenths on the S&P on the NASDAQ 100, down by about one fourth percentage point. But that number out earlier this morning, TK, it's got to be a big story, hasn't it? it we're is. responding to these higher mortgage costs and we're responding by not getting a yeah. mortgage. We mentioned this with Jan Hatius yesterday. He's truly expert at this. This is what he did for Bill Dudley and Ed McKelvey years ago. And he said this data is speaking and it's beginning to show changes in housing. John, I've noticed the 10 year yield now above 3%. Yes. That's like Dow 10,000. 320, 322 Mondays ago. <clears throat> then we yeah. dropped to about 284, the lows of the last two weeks, Tom. And now we're back again above 3%. Yeah. A lot of people getting caught on the wrong side of this once again. Tom City published moments ago. They just reflected on what Chairman Powell said yesterday when he talked about how they won't hesitate to keep pushing beyond the point of neutral yeah. and inflation does not call. He said this at the end. The market takeaway is clear. This is Andrew Hollenhorst on the team at City. Higher front end interest rates, elevated recession risk in 23-24 and a very negative environment for risk assets. Right now, joining us as well, readjusting and adapting is Seth Carpenter. He's global chief economist at Morgan Stanley. Seth, whether it was Maynard Keynes or many cite the giant Paul Samuelson, who said, when the facts change, well, I changed my mind. Right now, for the deciles of America, the facts are changing. How crushed will the middle class be? I think that's the right way to look at it, Tom. The distributional effects here are very important. We've had lots of things happen so far this year. We had the end of the child tax credit. We've had a surge in energy prices, and we've had a surge in uh, food prices. And so what does that mean? That means for people who are at the below the middle of the income distribution, their ability to spend on things besides those true staples has been diminished. And we're looking for that to be a big part of the slowdown in consumer spending this year. Uh, John Farrell mentioned a Citigroup with a more strident view, I would suggest, on rate rises than your Morgan Stanley and, frankly, many other shops as well. Is this a central bank where the facts will change and Jerome Powell will blink? Uh, I don't know about Blank, but I have to say uh, Jay Powell is in a very challenging situation because what they are trying to do is they're trying to slow this economy a lot but not too much, and neither of those is particularly well-defined. They're trying to bring the growth rate of the economy down enough so that the inflationary pressure that we're seeing outside of some of these temporary phenomena, the underlying trend for inflation, they want that to come down by slowing the economy enough that it goes away, but not so much that they tip things into recession. That's just such a terribly, terribly difficult job to do. Well, and your former boss, uh, the former Fed chair, uh, Ben Bernanke, put it as, as almost certainty heading into stagflation and frankly had some pretty harsh words for this Fed chair for the path that they have taken and not getting ahead of this. Do you agree? I mean, do you think that almost certainly we're headed toward a stagflationary like environment in the United States? Uh, very, very hard to sort of get into debates about definition of stagflation or not. I mean, I think the, the following is very, very true. Sharp deceleration this year, growth well under half of what we saw last year, and the risks clearly skew to the downside. I think in that sense, uh, there's clearly elevated risk for things going into recession. And then inflation, it's high. We have it coming down over the forecast period, but it's not going to be low. It's not going to be back to the 2% target anytime soon. So call it what you will, uh, it's going to be a rocky road. What's the new normal in terms of the inflation rate that seems more stable if it's not 2%? Uh, well, I still think the Fed very, very much wants to get back to 2%, but they're faced with a very challenging uh, set of facts, which is the following. Uh, you can either bring the excess inflation that we have down closer to 2% quickly, but that would require causing a pretty bad recession, or they can bring it down gradually, which means that the realized inflation will probably stay elevated for another couple of years. That's, that's a really difficult choice to be in. They're going to try to thread it so that they slow the economy down a lot without quite getting into recession. And that means that for the, end of, for the rest of this year, 
for the rest of next year and probably sometime into 2024, you're going to see inflation above their target. One thing that you've done really good work on is oil shocks. And we've been talking all morning about the potential for $6 average gas prices in the United States as per the expectation of J.P. Morgan. What would that do in terms of growth? How does that factor into your base case? It matters a lot, and it actually gets back to Tom's point about the distributional effects. So for people who uh, are living uh, paycheck to paycheck, who are consuming almost all of their current income and have to drive to work, that's a huge chunk of this population. They're just going to have less money left over to spend. Now, the, the funny thing is, in inflation terms, if gasoline gets up to, let's take your hypothetical 6%, and stays there, those inflationary effects start to go away, but people are still paying more out of their paycheck uh, each, each week, each month, each, each quarter, and that does continue to crimp spending. I, I look, Seth, at the, the game forward, and it comes up to a mid-year outlook, which I believe is delivered on Seth Carpenter's desk June 30. I don't think it matters because what, what matters is July 27, which is where the Fed meetings get excruciating. Am I right on that, that the two meetings out is really where this game gets tough? I think that is exactly right. So uh, Chair Powell said for the next couple of meetings, something like 50 basis points is right. I think he made clear, my view, he made it clear when he first said it, but he reinforced the view uh, yesterday that he's not ruling out anything else beyond that in either direction. And so the Fed really is going to have to be looking around a lot more, asking themselves, are we seeing any slowing in the real economy? Are we seeing signs that inflation is coming down? And quite honestly, because they're starting in June, the runoff of their balance sheet, are we seeing what the effects are of that so-called quantitative tightening? This is a tool that they've sort of used once before in a much smaller degree than what they're doing now. And they really are going to have to wait and see how that plays out through the financial yeah. markets and how it plays out in the economy. Nuance data dependent. I mean, you, t you took data dependency 102 at Princeton a few years <laughs> ago. Explain to our audience the weight of data dependency to the PhDs at the Eccles building. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the only game in town. It's funny that the term came into existence because there was never a time when policymaking was data independent. But here it's going to become that much more difficult because they're going to have to scrutinize every last bit of data to see what's going on. Monetary policy works, first policy tools, then financial markets, then the real economy, and then inflation. And so they have to scan with whatever high-frequency data they can conjure up each of those different links in the chain to see if they're getting traction with their policy tightening and to see if that traction is leading to lower inflation. It's a tough job. Seth, awesome to get you on the show. Thank you, buddy. As always, Seth Carpenter of Morgan Stanley. A range of views there. Here's another one from Goldman Sachs and the Chief Executive Officer, David Solomon, in a phone interview with Shanali Basakar, Wall Street correspondent, in the last 24 hours. She's just put out that piece, this interview. We have to get rid of inflation, Solomon said. Inflation is extremely punitive, especially on those that are living week to week, paycheck to paycheck. It's a big, big tax on that part of the society. Tom, talking about recession risk, but reflecting the work by Jan Hatzius yeah. and the team in the research department. Exactly. Reflecting on what his economics is saying, I think it's great that these CEOs are talking up the macroeconomic stuff. I want to know what he's going to do on the bond, uh, the bond desk where price down, yield up. I'm fascinated how global Wall Street manages this mother of all bond bear markets. One thing he said on spreads, Tom, yeah. Tom Alton credit spreads would be concerning. Are we at there the point of concern go. yet? Concerning. Are we there yet? Do I think we're there? Yes, I, I do think we're there yet right now. Yes. You think we're here? I think the, the price decline, log, Bloomberg, total return, aggregate, any credit series you want, I'll at least uh, pick that, is jaw-dropping back 20, it 30, is. 40 years. It oh. is. We're adjusting to rates, though. And Lisa, I know you can build on that. Is that concerning no. in and of itself for this Federal Reserve? Have we seen a dislocation in spreads? liquidity no can companies still come to market and raise money I mean, peloton look, yeah 
I was just going to say, Peloton could just raise a loan with a pretty risky business model at this point that's moving yeah. very quickly. If you take a look at spreads, they're well within norms that are not scary for the Fed. People are watching it. They are starting to widen out. This is what could potentially trigger the Fed put. It's not there yet, which means that they're going to keep hiking rates. So the flip side of that, that the, that the, that the bank CEOs are watching, is the, exactly what the Fed is watching as well. December 2018 for some people is somewhat of an extreme benchmark, but it's not December 2018. Yet, yeah. Futures down eight cents on the S&P. Coming up, Laurie Calvacina of RBC around the opening bell. Looking forward to that. Looking forward to catching up with Julian Emanuel of Evercore and Jay Poloski of TPW. All of that in the next hour on Bloomberg TV. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Rishka Gupta. Shares of Target fell more than 20% in early trading. The discount retailer cut its profit outlook, saying a surge in costs during the first quarter shows little sign of going away soon. Target's fuel and freight bill was a billion dollars more than expected. Additional hits came from higher pay for warehouse workers and markdowns driven by overstocked inventory. Goldman Sachs CEO David Solomon says clients are preparing for slowing growth and a decline in asset prices. Solomon told Bloomberg's Shanali Basik what he calls extremely punitive inflation is creating a tax on the economy. He sees a 30% chance of a recession in the U.S. over the next 12 to 24 months. And Bloomberg's learned the U.S. is forcing Wall Street banks to search more than 100 personal mobile phones carried by top traders and dealmakers. It's the largest ever investigation into secret messaging on platforms such as WhatsApp. The SEC will decide who to punish for failing to preserve business-related messages via unapproved platforms. And the EU is considering whether to use proceeds seized from Russian oligarchs to help rebuild Ukraine. The EU will also propose issuing joint debt. Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba told his European counterparts that the reconstruction bill could reach some $1.1 trillion. And the board of Twitter says it plans to enforce its $44 billion agreement to be bought by Elon Musk. Directors voted unanimously to recommend that shareholders approve Musk's bid of $54.20 a share, almost $16 higher than where the stock closed out on Tuesday. The board statement came as Musk appears to be maneuvering to ditch or renegotiate his offer. Global News 24 hours a day. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Putin's war is, as we all see, heavily disrupting the global energy market. It shows on one hand how dependent we are on imported fossil fuels. We must now reduce our, um, as soon as possible, our dependency on Russian fossil fuels. Ms. van der Leyen, who is really quite something, we have spoken to her numerous times at Davos. She is encyclopedic on the German military and, of course, with new duties in Brussels as well, speaking of Mr. Putin. We'll get to that in a moment. Right now, Kriti Gupta, I should say, with a chart. Kriti? Yeah, Tom, we got to talk about these record high gasoline prices, I believe $6 in California, $5 in Hawaii. And I really want to get to the crux of the problem because it's not just about the over $100 oil prices you see on your screen. It's about refining margins in particular. That brings me to my chart of the day. We're looking at the 321 crack spread. It gets a little nerdy, but stick with me here. Essentially, three barrels of WTI crude oil makes two barrels of gasoline, one barrel of distillates, which essentially is diesel or jet fuel. And what this shows or what this chart shows is this major major jump last week. It's coming down a little bit, but $50, that's the margin for refining. And one of the big questions here is, can a lot of these refiners, American refiners, if they do get their hands on crude, do they have the capacity to turn it into gasoline and some of these distillates? And it's really that concern that's so, partly driving up the prices. For the 12 people that just drove off the Garden State Parkway by some <laughs> refinery in New Jersey, is it done? I mean, is there any incentive with this record margin to make the distillates, make the stuff we use. That's the question for Javier Bloss, because right now oh. it feels like it's very tough to do that. Nice, Segui, Kriti Gupta there <laughs> on the movement to Mr. Bloss. Let's go to Javier Bloss with his true global expertise. Javier, I want to talk about China. I guess they're coming off lockdown. When you look at Bloss economics, including what Ms. Gupta just spoke of, what does it mean if China comes off lockdown? It means a lot higher prices. I mean, the only reason that we are uh, only at, at the levels that we are at about four and a half dollars per gallon on retail prices for gasoline in the United States and $115 for WTI is because China has not yet opened up. 
China opens, it's a lot more fight for crude oil and gasoline worldwide, and it means higher prices. There is just simply not enough of this stuff for everyone. So the price has to work and has to kill some demand. And if China comes back, I'm afraid that we are going to see higher prices. Jews also, as American drivers are hitting the road for the, the beginning of the summer season with Memorial Day, it's just going to be very painful. What are you looking at in terms of potential prices? Because we are seeing, uh, for example, refineries not keep pace at all, which seems to be the real big issue, not just crude prices. Uh, you are absolutely right. I mean, the, the prices I'm, I'm, I'm really looking is, you know, forget about the WTI price. It's just sending a, a misleading indicator of where the market is. You look at WTI, you are $115. If you look at the wholesale market for refined products, gasoline, diesel, and jet fuel, we are uh, somewhere between $170 and $230 a barrel. Depends on whether you're looking at gasoline or you're looking at diesel. At those levels, we should, still, we should start to see some demand destruction, particularly in emerging markets. And we are beginning to see that. The key question is that we have also a lot of pent up demand. People really want to travel. This is the first summer, the first spring of traveling after COVID-19. So I think that what we see is that prices may need to go higher to destroy demand just because of the extra appetite for traveling after two years of basically staying at home. So what will it take for refiners to actually just refine more? I mean, at what point does the supply side respond? The refiners, at least in the United States, they are really working almost as hard as they can. Uh, we, we are seeing operating rates already in the Gulf of Mexico around 90 percent, which is very high for this time of the year. We usually see lower operating rates because they are doing uh, seasonal maintenance. So uh, I'm not expecting that the refiners are going to work harder than they are. I mean, any refining executive today is trying to run their plants as hard as they can because the profit margin that you could make is just unheard of. I don't think that anyone in the American refining industry has ever dreamed to see the three to one refining margin north of 35, 40, let alone $50 mm -hmm. a barrel. I'm not expecting that refiners can do more. So we need to bring demand down. And the only way to bring demand down is through higher prices. Javier, my amateur take is the spread between West Texas Intermediate and Brent is four, five, six dollars. It can move around. Right now, American oil is 70 cents more expensive than Brent crude. Why and which one moves back to normal? I, I think that we will see at some point Brent come in uh, above WTI again. But at the moment, what we are seeing is uh, American refiners are buying as much crude as they can because they can make a ton of money refining that crude. And that's why we see so much pressure on WTI. It's pressure from the refiners, try to grab the barrels, and then refine them to profit from a huge uh, refining market. Meanwhile, Tony Blinken uh, just returning from his trip to Abu Dhabi. What do you think the ask is from the U.S. in 1-800-CALL-DOHA or 1-800-CALL-ABU DHABI? Well, the U.S. has been asking for a long time for both Abu Dhabi and Riyadh for more oil. But the main problem is just... You know, the, the, the White House has an ass, but the royal policies in the UAE and, and Saudi Arabia do have also their own ass. And neither is blinking, neither is giving up uh, on their particular request. And the result is that we are seeing OPEC production increasing very slowly. But even more barrels of Saudi oil and UAE oil were to hit the market today. Those barrels need to be refined. And, and really, the bottleneck right now is on the refining sector. More OPEC oil will help but they're not going to bring uh, gasoline yeah. prices for consumers immediately down. Javier, uh, a chart I have of Saudi light, and I adjust it different ways, but it goes back to the 1950s. It literally spans Daniel Jurgen's The Prize. The fact is we were all humbled in 1986. Is Saudi going to crush oil again if they have to break OPEC? If they have to, they will do it. I mean, they have demonstrated, Saudi Arabia has time and after time demonstrated that they are willing to do whatever is needed to keep control of the market. The, the position right now is that Saudi Arabia is sitting quite pretty. Uh, production is approaching an all-time high, most likely on an average, on an annual average, 2022 is going to mark the highest ever Saudi oil production. So Riyadh has... Uh, the, uh, the ability to really be in command of this market. If the economy is slowed down, 
at the end of the year or the beginning of 2023, they can cut production with no problem and uh, control prices. Um, but there is no much that they can right. do right now on the upside, I'm afraid. Javier Blas, thank you so, uh, so much. Just wonderful to visit with you as always. Of course, his wonderful book, folks, out on oil uh, trading as uh, well. Lisa, what a day. I don't know where yeah. to begin. I think that it's all about the consumer. It's all about pressures. And that's why this is a great st story to really end on, or perhaps not so great for people who are filling up their tanks. Right now, gas prices, to build on what Javier was talking about, reaching the highest on record in the United States, at least in a nominal level, $4.57. How high could it go? How much does this well, crimp the people's budgets at places like Target and Walmart? Walmart and reduces the pricing power of these retailers. This is the new episode of the economy that we're entering into. That is a AAA average price, folks, including cheap fuel in the Midwest. I think it's a little more expensive on the right <laughs> yeah, and California, left coast. You think? Stay with us. Bloomberg Radio, Bloomberg Television. Good morning.